Hello, Wake Forest, Winston-Salem, and beyond. Welcome to TEDx Wake 2021. I'm your director, Sarah Cruz, and I am so excited to welcome you to our event this year. We have an incredible lineup of speakers who are coming with ins insight and innovation and thought-provoking content that I cannot wait to share with you. Oftentimes, we are quick to act, quick to speak, and quick to judge but really not quick enough to truly listen. Based on the popular colloquialism, Spill the Tea is a call to action to open your ears and truly listen. Our speakers are coming with an immense amount of passion and innovation, and they have incredible stories to share with you about what it really means to be a truth seeker. When I joined Wake Forest a couple years ago, I knew I wanted to be a part of TEDx Wake. I wanted to replicate that electric feeling you get when you watch just a really good TED Talk. I'm so proud of the voices that we've brought to campus over the years, with this year being no exception. I would like to thank Wake Forest University for their support during these unconventional times. I'd also like to thank my family and friends for keeping me sane over the years. And most importantly, I'd like to thank my team for their tenacity and adaptability in navigating the hurdles that we've had to cross in order for this event to happen. Thank you again for spending your Saturday night with us and I encourage you to sit back and relax and listen to these incredible speakers. Now I'm gonna pass it off to our MCs for the evening, Camille and Tommy. Thanks Sarah for that introduction. I'm Tommy Murphy. And I'm Camille Monso. Welcome, Welcome to, to TEDx. TEDx. To get us started today, we first have Equity Warrior James Ford. James is the Executive Director of the Center for Racial Equity in Education and is the Principal Consultant for Filling the Gap Educational Consultants. James serves on the North Carolina State Board and in 2014, James was named the Charlatanian of the Year. I thought I had him beat that year. Hey, can you guys move further apart? Yeah, sorry. Please welcome James Ford. What do you think of when you hear the phrase white supremacy? What does it make you think? What does it make you feel? Do you um, see images of cross burnings and lynchings? Do you, um, do you hear the hurling of racial slurs and racial epithets? Do you think about, say, um, the uptick in hate crimes that have been occurring in the United States of America? Or maybe um, you might appropriately think about the insurrection that took place on January the 6th at the United States Capitol. Capitol. Um, all of these would make sense, right? All of these are, are fair game. And I think, yeah, I think those are white supremacy. But I want to invite you to think about white supremacy differently. I want you to consider that white supremacy is an ideology, yes, but it is, it, is, it is also a system of racism that flows out of that ideology, okay? So, you know, I know that might be a scary prospect for some folk, particularly considering all the outrage and, and, and the obsession suddenly with this with this concept of critical race theory that is presented almost as a boogeyman uh, to scare folks away. Uh, the concept of white supremacy as a system is something that in some communities people are presenting as fringe or scary. And I wanna to submit to you that that it's not. <laughs> and that critical race theorists no more invented that outlook on white supremacy than Sir Isaac Newton invented gravity, right? Or Benjamin Franklin invented electricity, right? This concept of white supremacy in that way, it, it predates um, any of these individuals well before it was theorized, okay? And so you can look at the writings of David Walker's appeal um, as evidence of that. You can look at um, the writings of W.E.B. Du Bois even and the souls of black folks. You can look at Ida B. Wells' documentation of uh, lynchings all across the country, or even James Baldwin's writings, or Dr. King's writings in the latter part of his life. All of them present a picture of white supremacy as operating on a systemic level. And so I wanna kind of push you 
away from the alarmist claims, and it, it encourages you to think about this a little bit differently, but I actually want to push you even further. And I want you to think about white supremacy as the greatest threat to the United States of America. Sit with that for a little while. I want you to consider that whatever happens to folks like myself, black folk or uh, brown folk, native indigenous folk or Asian folk, that we are merely the proverbial canaries in the coal mine. And that those things, they may begin with folks like myself and our groups, but they're ultimately coming for all of us. And while you think about that, uh, I'll take a couple minutes here, maybe for those who are unfamiliar, and just offer <laughs> a brief history of race. OK, um, in, in short, race is not new. Now, to be fair, it's not that old either, but it's presented as kind of like a natural state of affairs, like the, the, the society has always been organizing the racial groups. And while we've always had clans and tribes and, and as human beings, we've organized in that way. That's not what we're talking about when we look at the modern conception of race as a social construct. Race as we know it today comes from Europe. That's right. Race comes from Europe and Europeans. It is invented literally almost out of thin air. It's not based on any real science. Um, it is a categorization and a sorting of individuals based upon um, features that denote their ancestry, right? So things like skin tone, right? Things like uh, uh, body type, things like hair texture even, the width of one's nose, the thickness of one's lips. These indicate uh, where you might descend from. And these things are given merit to the point that they create a alleged hierarchy, right? So when Europeans created race, they also created uh, a, a ranking. And predictably, Europeans, whites, uh, they gave themselves top billing. They put themselves at the top uh, based upon the merit of their physical beauty, uh, of their superior intellect, uh, and of their uh, uh, ever-evolving and expansive culture. That was the alleged basis for that. OK. And while we know that for uh, every yin, there must be a yang. Right. There's a duality there that that when you have a, a positive, then you got to have a negative. And so. The bottom of that hierarchy is assigned to black folks or African descended people, people like myself. And while uh, whiteness is expanded and the categories themselves have 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 brought in out that um, even this ever evolving nature of whiteness, it, it, it continues to reinforce the ideas and the myths of superiority. And so whiteness begins to denote as much as it as, as it denotes superiority and supremacy. It also is defined by its distance from blackness. OK, the fact that it is not black is what creates whiteness. These concepts, they, they are nurtured, they are developed, they are theorized um, in Europe over the 1700s and 1800s, and eventually they become exported, right? Because they make their way throughout the rest of the globe, because they provide justification for the invasion of other countries. They provide the justification for colonialism. Right. They provide the justification for uh, imperialism. And so as a result of that, these ideas of racial superiority are exported to the ends of the earth. They find their way into scientific literature. They find their way into the religious and theological propositions that are offered, even find their ways into the law. In the United States of America, the term white first appears in the Virginia legislature in the early 17th century. And so um, whiteness becomes a global construct, as does white supremacy. And what's important to know about this is that it's really an organizing principle. Right. Early on, it was Western Europeans, Eastern European Europeans weren't invited into that concept. Right. Uh, but it, it's a dance. It's a choreographed dance of steps that if one is from European stock, they must learn and perform if they want to be proximate to power. 
You can't understand anything that's happening in the world unless you first understand that historical context. Now, the question is, where does that leave folks like myself? Where does that leave folks who are on the outside of whiteness, non-white others? How do people of color, black folk, Latinx folk, right? Asian folk, right? Arab folk, Native Americans, where do they fit? into this American society. And the truth is, I mean, I'm being flippant, but we really don't, at least not neatly, initially, right? And that's funny to me because imagine America without the contributions and the presence of these various groups of color, right? It simply would not be uh, what it is today. And yet, white supremacy provides the justification for the forced removal of Native American folk uh, from their land. It provides the justification for the dispossession and the theft uh, of their territories. White supremacy provides the justification for creating a slave-based society that, that the primary economic engine of which is the forced servitude, right? Chattel and perpetual slavery that is intergenerational. It enshrines the subhuman status of African descended folk, of black folk, into its founding documents. White supremacy is the justification of, of limiting and restricting immigration only to those who come from European countries. And the outright and explicit ex exclusion of, of those from Chinese origin. White supremacy um, limits where people of color can live. It limits where they can go to school. White supremacy um, restricts whether or not they can vote. It even determines whether their testimony is admissible in the court of law. In short, it creates an entire system around this idea, right? It is foundational, it is formative to the function of the United States of America, but even more so, these things are not merely historical. Why am I talking about stuff that happened in the past? That happened a long time ago, right? Quit dwelling in the past. Well, I would submit to y'all that white supremacy is alive and well today and that there's a historical legacy that carries on. What does it look like? I'm glad you asked. In the modern context, say in my industry and in education, white supremacy looks like what is commonly known as the racial achievement gap, right? Which really merely exposes the pre-existing gaps and opportunity to just show up gaps academically. White supremacy shows up in our healthcare sector. We see it with the COVID epidemic, but even beyond that, we see it uh, in a whole stretch of different areas. So everywhere from the maternal birth outcomes for black women and women of color on to how much pain medication someone is given in the emergency room. Race is a huge influence on things such as that. We see it in the criminal justice system. It, it influences everything about uh, our encounters with police, both how we're policed um, who's arrested, how we get sentenced, as well as who disproportionately dies at the hands of law enforcement. And even housing, right? Even, uh, uh, you know, the economy, as it were. Um, we suffered from the housing crash in the early 2000s. That was due in part because black and brown people were being targeted with subprime mortgages, even when they qualified, y'all for prime mortgages by comparison to their white counterparts. So the collapse of the economy was facilitated by white supremacy. All of these things are modern manifestations. And you know, um, I wanna pause here because I realize that for some that this might be kind of overwhelming, right? This might be a lot to conceive. Like it's unfathomable for some people, I'm sure, that, uh, that so much of our lives, right, would be governed by this idea called race, right? That identity would be wrapped up and, and, and so many things would orbit around this thing. And, you know, why does everything have to be about race, they say? I get asked that question a lot. And the truth of the matter is this. In short, it really always has been to some extent, right? Just to keep score, race was created by Europeans. It was exported throughout the ends of the earth, right? 
where whole societies were propped up and every aspect of life was racialized. And so then to ask people of color who are on the receiving end of this arrangement why everything has to be, out, be about race is, quite frankly, as gaslighting. It's a question that should not be directed to us and probably is more appropriate, appropriately asked to, well, white people. <laughs> why does everything have to be about race? Be that as it may, I mean, if there are intended victims of white supremacy, you could argue that it's most certainly people of color. But the irony is, you know, if there are unintended victims, it's actually white people. Um, turns out that white supremacy is actually not any good for anybody, that it actually hurts everybody in the long run, as it were. Um, who would have thunk it, right? Uh, there is an aversion oftentimes to policies that would actually benefit white people as well, but because the perception is that they would help people of color, this has influenced a lot of people's political leanings and their positioning. You know, we have the blessing of really good social science being done right now. So researchers and scholars like Martin Gillens have discovered that, yeah, for policies that would typically be labeled quote unquote progressive. They would expand the social safety net. They would raise the minimum wage. They would uh, create Medicare for all that for a lot of white Americans, their opposition to those policies is not really as much partisanship or even a fiscal conservatism as much as it is about the perception of who might benefit. In other words, it is a politics of harm. It is completely based upon and influenced by who we think might be hurt rather than what might heal us. Think of, that's just how crazy it is. So never mind the fact that white folk categorically are the majority of folks who are on the roles of welfare, right? Never mind the fact that white folk are numerically the majority of those living beneath the poverty line in America, that many white folk will still oppose policies that might benefit them because they don't hurt people of color enough. You know, that's a dangerous way to engage, right? And it's not economic anxiety as much as it is a game of keep away, right? The author, Joe Bajent, uh, who wrote the book Deer Hunting with Jesus, in that text, he talks about how in his hometown in Appalachia and Virginia, how, how the folks that he grew up with, we're talking about working class white folk, we're talking about really hard scrabble, often poor white folk, how their governing philosophy for voting and endorsing things that are actually against their own economic interests is that, well, at least I ain't black. What a way to carry on, right? And that just really exposes the self-cannibalizing nature of this investment in white supremacy. And I keep thinking to myself when I read things and I hear things like this, like, well, who is talking to the white folks and letting them know that this investment in the idea of white supremacy, that you somehow share this connection with folks who are wildly wealthy and frankly don't really care about you, that, 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 that you are, are a part of that uh, family <laughs> and that you, by supporting folks and showing racial solidarity, are benefiting at all, right, by, by supporting things that are against your own economic interests. Who is telling them that you know, and being radically honest in the way that Malcolm X would talk to black folks on the street corners of, of, of Harlem and saying, you know, you've been hoodwinked, bamboozled, led astray, run amok. Who is talking to the white folks and letting them know that in the grand scheme, the belief and the investment in white supremacy is a hustle. It's a racket. It's an absolute scam. And they're being taken and being harmed as a result of it. Truth of the matter is there are figures who have come about who've attempted to do this sort of organizing. You know, one can't help but mention Fred Hampton, the chairman of the Illinois Black Panther Party in the 1960s. Fred Hampton in the inner cities of Chicago was organizing the Black Panthers in tandem with young Puerto Ricans like the Young Lords, former gangs who were now becoming politicized, and poor whites who were living in inner city Chicago, suffering and living in squalor, who had themselves been displaced from their Appalachian coal mining communities and dropped off in inner city America. They were suffering at the hands of police brutality. 
you know, bum landlords and just systemic mistreatment. Fred helped them to see that as he's famously quoted as saying, we don't fight racism with racism, we fight racism with solidarity. He illuminated the alignment between the self-interests of these poor Southern rural white folk and the experiences they had with that of folks of color and the oppression that they were experiencing. And he, he drew a through line and he began to organize them in an anti-racist way to form solidarity. And I wonder where those sort of movements have gone and what has happened to those rainbow coalitions that Fred Hampton seeded and created. Dr. Martin Luther King, very similarly, after taking a trip to rural Appalachia and seeing the abject poverty they were living in, um, organized a poor people's campaign because he saw and expanded the vision of, of, of civil rights as not just racial justice, but, but also a matter of economic justice as well. Now, both of these individuals were assassinated. And so if anything would indicate the true threat to the status quo, it should be the fact that they were both murdered. You know, violence is often a response when we try to resist white supremacy. And as I think about what happened on January the 6th, I can't help but bring the alarm and say that, you know, if we don't get a handle on this, we will lose our democracy. This experiment, it's over if we don't confront it head on. You know, when the insurrectionists breached the Capitol on January the 6th, there's a photo that emerged as a result of that. And it's of a man carrying a Confederate battle flag. And he's seen in the rotunda of the Capitol. And as he holds this flag, you can see in the background a, 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 a picture, a portrait of a white man, older guy, and that individual seemingly overlooking the insurrection and pride is none other than John C. Calhoun, former U.S. Senator from South Carolina. A rabid pro-slavery advocate and the intellectual architect of what we would now consider minority rule. See, Nancy McLean in her book, Democracy and Chains, gives credit to John C. Calhoun as being the progenitor of this idea that, you know, his wildly extremist policies, once they become so unpopular that they no longer appeal to the majority of Americans, that in a democracy where majority rule is how we govern, that the way that you transition is you simply shrink the voting populace. You operate against the will of the majority. And so for John C. Calhoun, this notion of minority rule became the way that individuals should govern. John C. Calhoun is credited with planting the seed that has grown into the far right wing extremist movement that we see today as manifested in the insurrection on January the 6th. And so you cannot begin to understand where we are the social political time of day, unless you understand that context. These are not outliers. <laughs> They're actually microcosms of what is to come. Stephen V. Miller, a researcher from Clemson, uh, produced an article in 2018. Um, and as a political scientist, he looked at the support for democracy amongst white Americans. And he particularly looked at those who hold prejudices. And what he found was essentially this, that for white Americans that held prejudices of racial, cultural, ethnic others, there was a correlation between their level of prejudice and their support, a diminishing support for democracy. Think about that. That if whites had prejudices against others, that they were willing to forego the principles of democracy and support of that. This article, as well as the data that is produced, it predates Trump. And so what we saw, <laughs> this didn't emerge out of the ground. This is part of a larger problem that we have to confront. 
And I'll end by telling you the story. Um, you know, um, I'm a teacher by trade. And I remember going in 2012 on a, on a trip to New York City for some professional development with some of my colleagues. And in our spare time, we hopped on a train and we uh, went out to a neighborhood called Astoria in Queens, New York. This is a historic Italian-American neighborhood and we were going out to uh, get some cannoli. Somebody had recommended that they were really good out there. And uh, we stopped off in a, um, a family-owned bakery and as we were getting ready to place our orders, kind of looking through the glass, we heard a loud commotion outside. Nobody knew what was going on. We heard screams and yells and horns blasting. We're like, what on earth is going on? And so, you know, we turned around and went outside and rushed. And we went out there. What we saw was a whole line of cars and people flooding the sidewalk, screaming and yelling and cheering. Folks were standing on top of cars, hanging out the windows of cars, waving big Italian flags. And what we didn't know was at that moment we were in, they're getting ready to place our order. The Italian national team had just secured a victory over Germany in the 2012 UEFA Euro Championship. And they moved on uh, to the championship game where they would face Spain. And so it was a huge upset. And so really what they were doing is they were celebrating their mother country. They were celebrating and demonstrating pride in their heritage and in their lineage and in their ancestry. And so, you know, the horns blaring and the, the euphoria, the screams and the yells, and even the guy who owned the bakery, he came out while we were standing out there and hung up, hung up an Italian flag. And I got to tell you, on a real level, like, I felt that. It sent a chill down my spine. I could relate, even if I wasn't part of that community, but I had to stop and ask myself the question, how is it that I can vicariously feel the sense of pride and I can respect and appreciate the celebration of these folks as they affirm their culture, as they affirm their identity and an outward expression of joy and celebration and not feel that my own identity is threatened? How can I exist in this environment when I'm obviously not Italian and, and, and sense that? And it dawned on me that's it's because I'm a human. <laughs> I'm a human being and somebody elevating, celebrating their identity, standing firm on who they are, doesn't threaten me in mine. And so I say that to say this. The inability to live at peace with people who don't look like you, who are different than you, who speak different languages than you, who worship different than you, who have a different ancestry than you, the inability to live at peace with folks like that is not a mark of civilization. In fact, it makes you dysfunctional. And it will render our country dysfunctional. White supremacy is going to destroy America as we know it. But if we are to be this multi- racial democracy that we hold ourselves out to be despite our white supremacist foundations, then that begins by us ending white supremacy. And that starts now. I'm James Ford. Thank you for coming to my TED Talk. Thank you, James, for that speech. Here's my culinary creation, chef. This is it? It's a red velvet cookie. What, what do you mean? What do you, what do you think? Uh, I, I hate it. It's like you want me to be Manit Shahan or something. I'll never be able to elevate the use of spices or utilize my own journey and experiences and my own culinary creations. You'll also probably never be a permanent judge on Chopped, or will you ever win the James Beard Award for Culinary Excellency? I mean, don't count me out yet. She is our next speaker. I could, I could learn a few things. Please welcome Manit Shahan. A woman's place is in the kitchen. Right you are. It is. For ages, women have been told that their place is in the kitchen. I agree. I agree that our place is in a professional kitchen leading the brigade and succeeding. So in this day and age, 
why are we still having this conversation about the gender of a chef? I remember this conversation. Are you learning to cook so that you can make delicious food for your husband when you get married? This was a question which was posed to me by a cook in the first professional kitchen that I had ever worked in, in India. As I had missed each and every class on how to act demure, I promptly turned and I asked this cook if he had become a cook to make delicious food for his wife. Oh my God, he was aghast. He turned to me and very angrily told me that cooking at home was his wife's responsibility and that was what her place was. Needless to say, I was labeled as the girl in the kitchen who was too smart for her own good. I grew up in a really small town in India. It was a professional community. Uh, all the kids were encouraged to follow a career path and the most popular career choices were to be an engineer or a doctor or if you're really looking outside the box, an accountant. Very early on, I realized that that was not going to be any of my choice. Early on, I also realized that I had a love affair with food. It started from eating delicious dishes at home to realizing that my neighbors were creating different regional cuisines, which fascinated me so much. So in fact, the story is that I would finish dinner at home go over to my neighbor's houses, knock out their door, and proclaim that my parents hadn't fed me. So I invited myself to their dining table or into their kitchens, cooking with the aunties. These aunties unlocked a wonderful world of flavors, ingredient, and techniques to me, which I didn't see in my own home. The aha moment happened when my older sister went to do her undergrad. I would show up at her school with cakes and food and soon I realized that I was the most popular kid on campus even though I didn't go to school there. And that's the time I realized that I could do something that I love and people love me for it. That's when I realized that I wanted to be a chef. My family was extremely supportive. The only set of instructions they gave me was to do whatever I wanted, but to make sure that I was the best at what I did. And that's a mantra that I hold close to my heart till date. As a strong educational foundation was very important, I applied to the best hospitality schools in India. And I was really fortunate to be a part of the Welcome Group Graduate School of Hotel Administration. I did my undergrad there. Uh, they weren't culinary schools per se in India, so you had to do your hotel management to get into the kitchen. While my friends had the ambition to be a front office manager or to be in the front of the house or in sales and marketing, I think I was the only girl in my school who wanted to be a chef. It was an obsession. It was a single-minded focus. In fact, I still remember a lot of my instructors came up to me and told me that maybe going into marketing and sales would be an easier life for a girl. Well, for those who know me, know that the only way to get me to do something is to tell me that it can't be done. So I did it. All my externships were in five-star hotels in India where inevitably I would find myself being the only girl in a kitchen of 50 to 60 men. I had to hold my own. Uh, I had to show that I was strong even when I didn't feel it. Um, and I think that was a great foundation for me. In fact, I remember this incident very vividly. Um, I was on an externship, I was at the fryer station, so there was a fryer in front of me full of hot oil. Uh, there was a server who came and was trying to throw a piece of bread on top of the salamander. 
and the bread missed its mark. It fell into the oil, the hot oil, and there were droplets of oil on my face. It was hot, it hurt. But because I was in a kitchen, and because I knew that the entire team underestimated me, the fact that they would, she is a girl. I wanted to cry, but I needed to be strong enough to prove that I had a place in the kitchen. I took a deep breath, I turned to my chef, and I asked him if I could be excused. I went running to the locker, washed my face with cold water, and cried because I couldn't cry in front of the team. I couldn't show that I was weak. Um, those things have changed a lot right now. I embrace my strength and I embrace my weaknesses because that's who I am. But that was an incident that, that made a, a big impact on who I am and how I carry myself in the kitchen. I still remember when I was in the locker crying, there were a couple of people who just walked in, some women, whose first reaction was, are you going to spend the rest of your life in the kitchen? And I turned to them and I said, it's no different from what you do. The only difference is that I want to spend the rest of my life in a professional kitchen. Um, there were also uh, whispers of, oh my God, if those marks don't go from her face, she will never get married. So the entire focus was that you get older and you get married. There wasn't this calling, a professional calling. So for me to be a chef as a girl, as a woman, was so outside the box of what was deemed normal. Nearing graduation, I asked my chef instructor which was the best culinary institute in the entire world to go to. And without even batting an eyelid, he said the CIA. Uh, by the way, CIA is the Culinary Institute of America before you think I'm anything cooler than a chef. And going to the CIA was an incredible experience because I found myself under the same roof with 2,000 other people who were as passionate about food as I was. And there was such a big majority of them which were women and girls, and it was exciting. The interesting part was that baking and pastry had more women in it, while culinary had lesser women in it. And I would always have this conversation as to why, why does this happen? And when my friends would come back from externships and would tell stories of how some kitchens were not receptive to women working on the line, working as chefs, and I understood why there weren't so many women in culinary, but I also didn't understand. I mean, wasn't a chef a chef? Wasn't the goal the same, to put your best foot forward and to make the best food that you can? Would the guests know the difference if the dish in front of them was made by a man or by a woman? Wasn't the underlying statement that the food needs to be good? I would always have these conversations in my mind. The why? Is it because they thought that, uh, that, that we were not strong enough or were too emotional? Or was the fact that they were just intimidated that we had the superpower of multitasking, among other things? Recently, a very famous chef weighed in on this conversation. He said, for women, the body clock starts working and it's evolution. And it's one thing to have a nine to five job and quite another to be a chef with kids. So that makes it difficult. Needless to say, the chef, who is a man, has three kids. Why did he make the assumption that it would be easier for him to be a globally successful chef with three kids while it would be difficult for a female chef to be successful? I think I know the answer.
The answer is that he's successful because he has an incredible support system. He is in a community and a society where it is expected that the woman takes care of the house and the kids. Well, I have two kids of my own and I'm thankful that I can be a chef, I can be a restauranteur and I can be successful in what I do. And I think that the reason for that is twofold. The first is that I believe in myself. I have been given a platform, I have been given a foundation and I have been given the faith and the strength to succeed by my parents and my family. The other more important part is that my support system is incredible. My husband, Vivek Deora, who is not only a business partner, I consider him a mentor, I consider him one of my biggest supporters. He is there rooting for my success as I am rooting for his. We are not only each other's biggest support system, but the biggest cheerleaders. And that I think is so important. To succeed, you need to surround yourself with people who want you to succeed and believe in your success. And when that happens, the gender line, it blurs. So to me, the crux of the matter is opportunities. Women need to be given the same opportunities as men get. In the kitchen or in any profession. Women require the same amount of validation. They need the same amount of respect and the same amount of support that men get when they go out in the world to work. Women can do the same job as men. And I'm waiting for the day when we stop having this discussion about the fact that there is a woman in the kitchen or a man in the kitchen because a chef is a chef. When a chef walks into the kitchen, the team doesn't say, good morning, man chef, good morning, woman chef. They say, good morning, chef. And that needs to be normalized. That is a conversation that needs not to be a conversation. It should be a normal thing to see a woman chef leading a kitchen or a man chef leaving a kitchen because in the end of the day, it is a difficult career path. So when they say a woman's place is in the kitchen, I wholeheartedly agree because I have found my place in my kitchen, be it my four restaurants, my professional world, or be it at home where we are cooking as a family and instilling the learnings in our kids that they can succeed in any career they choose. In the end of the day, what is important is to follow your passion and to love what you're doing. And passion shouldn't be divided by gender. Thank you, that was a great speech. I think it was a great speech. These are all pre-recorded, so yeah. Oh, Murph, what are you doing? I thought I had this one. Oh, I was just in the area, so I thought I'd stop by. What? Yeah, I was driving around in my super cool flying sports car prototype made by Sam Bosefield. What a coincidence, he's our next speaker. Shut up, no way. Please, Please welcome, welcome Sam, Sam Bosefield. Bosefield. Artists dream the future, and the future they dream about has flying cars. This isn't just an American dream. For example, Leonardo da Vinci, who was quite taken with flying designs back in the 15th century, came up with one approach which by today's standards might look simplistic. But you have to realize that this was in the early days of horse and buggy and bows and arrows. The amazing thing is that he was able to look into the future and see that we would fly. He wasn't the only person of ages past to dream this future. One can trace back to ancient Egypt and see flying chariots depicted. No, this particular dream appears to have spanned the ages. 
Now, more recently, most of the movies about the future, Star Wars, Star Trek, Fifth Element, show the major transportation happening in the skies and very little on the ground. Perhaps the most famous show featuring flying, flying cars was a 1950s cartoon comedy of a family in the future called The Jetsons. It is amazing to me to realize that all of that advanced technology dreamed up for the show has actually been produced, and we take it for granted today. Escalators, cell phones, talking computers, and of course a flying car. All were invented and put into production, except the flying car. That's next. But the takeaway is that the future society of the Jetsons traveled by air. This only makes sense as there's much more space for traffic above the ground than on the ground. In the sky, layers upon layers of traffic are possible with no stop signs, no traffic lights, and no construction to slow you down. And you can travel in a straight line, which is the shortest distance between any two points, right? So, if the future of transportation is in the air, how do we get from where we are now, mostly ground traffic, to the future where most of the traffic is in the air? That's the first question I asked before I decided to develop a flying car. Now everything has a starting point, a middle, and an end. This could be said of almost anything in this universe, including stories, a building, or life itself. In the case of flying cars, there are vehicles that could be used at the start of this great change in transportation. There are vehicles that are likely to be useful in the middle of this changeover to airborne travel. And there are vehicles that will definitely be huge up to the end of the need for transportation of this kind. I believe we will start with something that would both drive and fly, like our vehicle, the switchblade. Something that could use our existing infrastructure of roads and airports. Something that you could do now. This seems to be a reasonable first step or a starting point. Now a lot of you have undoubtedly seen the articles and news about vertical takeoff and landing or VTOL ta air taxis. The different varieties of VTOLs could form the middle phase of this transition, which would stretch out over time as there are decades needed to establish the infrastructure required to allow that form of transportation to become useful. You can see why, as with the VTOL, you have to land where you want to go. And currently there's no places to land safely at grocery stores, hotels, the dentist's office, or even any neighborhoods. I see that the driving and flying cars will continue throughout much of this middle step of the VTOL until there are enough landing places to tip the scale in the VTOL direction, at which point it's likely that the large majority of vehicles would then be of the VTOL type. Now there's another category of vehicles that will take over once someone invents anti-gravity technology. I know what you're thinking, but remember, artists dream the future, and this is what they see. At that point, whenever that happens, we can remove the propellers and noise from the equation. Then it's game over. Who would not want to be whizzing around in their own space age hover car, right? That would be the foreseeable end game and high point of the conversion of transportation into the skies. Well, what is this future transportation system going to look like? If you're going to predict future transportation, how would it operate? For one, it would have to be as easy or easier than driving a car. One would likely step inside the vehicle, punch in a destination and say, engage, or something like that if you're a Star Trek fan. The computer would take you on the quickest and safest route to your destination. Does this mean the end of being able to drive or pilot your own vehicle? I definitely hope not. I love to drive, and flying my own aircraft is a dream in itself. What it does mean is that air traffic control, ATC, will need an upgrade to handle this new traffic. Right now, human AT, ATC staff manage the thousands of flights daily across the U.S., and that system works well. If we begin to take advantage of this new form of transportation and the air traffic volume goes ballistic in numbers, then we will probably need to project highways in the sky, little boxes 
that you would help uh, fly through as to keep you safe. And assigned by computers who monitor traffic volumes and destinations being requested. This could handle roughly 90% of routine traffic leaving human controllers to handle the remaining 10% as exceptions. There will always be that time when you forget to turn off the stove or you left your phone behind or some other catastrophic event, right? And a human would likely guide you out of the planned route and onto a return route in order to handle changes of plans. So bringing it back to the present, the short to middle game in this newly created future will be handled by flying cars, something that drives and flies. Now, who could benefit from this? Well, let's look at some stats for the U.S. There are over two and a half million mega commuters driving two hours each way to work. And yes, many of these are not commuting right now due to the pandemic, but that too shall pass. There are also 18 million regional leisure and business travelers each year driving 10 hours each way on their average trip. They could save 65% of their travel time using a flying car. For the business world, that adds up to $90 billion just in the cost of hourly wages lost in travel. So it isn't hard to imagine why the business world could benefit. How about you? What would your life be like if you could travel 500 miles in two and a half hours? Think of the places you could get to, the people you could see. What would this mean to your lifestyle? Think about this tonight and come up with your own conclusions. Now, what would have to happen before flying cars become commonplace? Probably they would need to be affordable, as not many people could afford to pay a half million dollars for a new airplane. They would need to be usable and not just a toy for once a month fun. They would be practical, not easily damaged or overly complicated. It would have to be safe, safe to drive, safe to fly, and a parachute for the whole vehicle might not be a bad idea. Finally, they would have to be fun. Pleasurable things are embraced. Painful things are usually shunned. You don't find many people planning a vacation and thinking how wonderful it would be to spend it being stuck in traffic just to get there, arriving exhausted and stressed, I can't wait for it, and then having to repeat that on the way home. Wouldn't it be wonderful if the trip somewhere was just as pleasurable as the destination? These were the goals we set and met with the Switchblade flying sports car. So how does the Switchblade fit in? Well, you store it in your garage, ready to take you on your next adventure. It operates using existing infrastructure, roads and airports that are already there. Little known fact, most people in the U.S live within 15 minutes of an airport. You gotta check that out when you get home, see where yours are. There are 5,000 public use airports and most are within six miles of the city that they serve. When you compare this to the 500 airports that have scheduled service, you can see there are many more places you can get to with a switchblade than you can with commercial flight. This is probably why we have reservation holders in 37 countries internationally and in all 50 states in, in America. Want to know the two most frequent questions we get asked? The first is, how does it transform from driving to flying? Good question. And the second is, does it have cup holders? The answer is yes, we have cup holders. And let's show you how this transforms. Once out of the garage and in a safe place to make the change, you push a button and the tail moves backwards and starts to unfurl. It looks a little organic during this process. The clamshell doors in the belly of the vehicle open up to allow the wings to swing out. When the wings and tail are fully extended, they lock in position, ready for flight. Now I'm sure that many of you have heard that a flying car could be either a mediocre plane or a mediocre car or both. That is a common misconception on our biggest roadblock to acceptance, as the switchblade was designed to be high performance in both modes. It is a blast to drive and it flies up to 200 miles per hour. There's nothing mediocre about the switchblade. And there's nothing mediocre about the benefits of flying car travel either. For one, you're never stopped. You can fly right over construction or dense traffic. If weather ahead looks bad, you 
land and drive under the weather. Say you took off from Wake Forest area and flew the hour and 15 minutes to Charleston on the coast, had dinner, and walked out to find the fog had rolled in. Most aircraft would be grounded, but you can simply get in and drive out from the fog and then take off and fly the rest of the way home. You travel on your own schedule in one vehicle, no Uber, taxi, or rental car, and your belongings stay with you the whole way. In Samson's case, we are designed to be ready for autonomous driving and flying in case that really becomes a thing. This is not easy, actually. We've spent the last 13 years doing what no one has been able to do so far. For instance, fly-by-wire controls. Fly-by-wire means that the pilot is directing the flight using a joystick or control wheel. But there's no mechanical link to the wings or tail where these commands are carried out. It is all done electronically. Usually, this is only found on military or large commercial aircraft. We had to develop our own system, applicable to something like the switchblade. The switchblade also has an electric hybrid drive system. It's easy to see the world is going electric, and there are a lot of advantages in that. Our system is tailored specifically for flying cars, and has advantages that no other form of transportation can offer. Again, often you drive from one city to another, but you have to dodge away from your way out of the way to get there due to the highway system, right? You're starting here, you're ending here, you have to go like that. Flying cars allow you to go directly from one point to the other, reducing the time of travel and the fuel used. A benefit to your fellow man is that when you take your vehicle off the highways or roads, you speed up the travel for others and that can have a large impact on reducing traffic congestion as a whole. Just 3 to 5% reduction of peak traffic allows the rest of the vehicles to double their speed. And there's one particular benefit for the environment that we at Sampson have added. We have spent four years perfecting methods of construction that allow us to create flying cars using recyclable materials. In addition, our manufacturing process does not get off toxic fumes, and what little waste we have is recycled into secondary products. This is very unlike current methods of aircraft construction. The switchblade is really a paradigm shift in a lot of different ways. Now here's a big question. How will we train all of these new pilots? Per the FAA, there are already 600,000 licensed pilots in the U.S., either student pilots or private pilots. But for new people wishing to be pilots, I'm happy to tell you that in my experience, it is actually not that hard to fly. Flying is the easy part. The hardest part is learning the language. You have to learn to speak pilot. If you talk to governments, they will tell you that the official worldwide language of flight is English. It isn't. It is pilot. Don't believe me? Just listen in on your next commercial flight to the radio chatter between pilots and ground control. I would be amazed if you could make out half of what they're saying. I know I couldn't before I began pilot training. It is literally like a new language. And this is one of the key reasons that people fail in pilot training. They don't approach it as a new language. And when their instructor starts talking pilot to them, they go blank. They don't understand it and they think they might be dumb or something and give up. Not so. You just haven't learned the language yet. By the way, this is applicable to any field of study. So if you're having a hard time with a subject, make sure you have learned the language. Make sure you understand the words being used. Currently, there's a 70% dropout rate for student pilots. Unacceptable, to say the least. We're going to change that by offering a pilot training program that breaks down flying into small steps that one can learn in an orderly fashion, one part building on the part before it. We're also defining terms as we introduce them so that this new language can be easily understood. It takes 20 hours or so of ground training and 40 hours of in-the-air flight training before you can become a private pilot. One improvement made through the Federal Aviation Administration, the FAA, is the use of flight simulators. With the new breed of flight sims, you can actually log the time as flight hours up to a certain amount. At Samson, our sim was created in-house 
to raise the bar for flight training and provide a very realistic experience. You push the button to have the unit open up so you can enter from the side like you would enter into the switchblade. Then you sit down in an actual switchblade cockpit while the unit closes up around you. We have a digital dashboard and instruments on flat screens to simulate the exact setup you would be flying with. There are three projectors set up to provide 180 degree visuals and a Mongo computer to allow very high graphics quality for the scenery. With this, we can program in different scenarios for the student to practice over and over until they master it before going on to the next scenario or before doing this maneuver in an actual aircraft with their flight instructor. We have a lot of people who are not pilots who want to become switchblade owners and this is how we're helping them achieve their goals and helping them become proficient pilots. Safety features are also abundant in the switchblade. Front and rear crumple zones, side impact protection, rollover protection, and a whole vehicle parachute. We feel the switchblade will be the safest small aircraft in production for these and a host of other reasons. Now you might be interested in what life is like using a flying car. As mentioned, you would store it in your garage pack your belongings in the vehicle as you would for a driving trip, then you would simply drive it to the closest airport, push a button, and the wings and tail begin to swing out lock and position. You then take off and fly towards the airport closest to your destination. The views along the way may astound you. The world looks very different from a few thousand feet above the ground. Commercial jets usually fly at altitudes of 20 to 30,000 feet, so you really can't see much. From a flying car, you can see many things that others will never catch a glimpse of, and it is often gorgeous. It's just amazing what you can see. Then you land the flying car, push the button again to retract the wings and tail, which stow safely inside the vehicle to protect them while driving, and drive those last few miles to complete your journey. A journey that may be just as enjoyable as the destination. I've enjoyed sharing a journey into the future with you. And I would like to end by saying that the future is what we create. We create it, good or bad. Personally, I want a future that includes flying cars. I think a lot of you share that vision. The freedom to travel on your own terms, having your own personal time machine to take the time out of travel so you can explore those special places in life, or see family and friends more often or get to that critical business presentation that will make your life and our lives a better place. The future is what we create. So let's create a bright and vibrant one. Thank you. Our next presenter is Joe Torre. Torre was a former player, manager, and television color commentator. From 1996 to 2007, Torre served as a manager for the New York Yankees and led them to four World Series championships. He is now a professional baseball executive and has served as a special assistant to the commissioner since 2020. Please, Please welcome, welcome Joe, Joe Torre. Hi, my name is Joe Torre and I'm a baseball lifer, I guess. Now, don't get uneasy in your seats. It doesn't mean that uh, I'm going to be staying here for three hours or nine innings. Uh, we'll do two or three innings, okay? And we'll talk about failure. We'll talk about success. Um, I had a long career. I, I started my uh, baseball career in 1960 in the minor leagues and played in Eau Claire, Wisconsin my first year. And uh, actually, at the end of that year, I was called up to the Milwaukee Braves. And uh, that's where I started my professional career and stayed with the Braves um, for eight years. And uh, it was uh, a pretty good experience. My brother Frank had played for Milwaukee uh, back in 1957 when they beat the New York Yankees. Um, four games to three in 1957. Little did I know, by the way, that uh, the next time, well, actually they played in 1958 also, but the next time the Yankees and the Braves played in the World Series, I'd be managing the Yankees, and that was 1996. Um, 
when I talk about being a lifer, uh, I grew up being a baseball fan. I'm the youngest of five children. Baseball is all I wanted to do. I think it was the fact that my brother Frank was a big influence in my life. Uh, and I really, uh, I wasn't uh, a bad student. I just didn't like school very much. So I was really banking on doing something connected with sports, baseball especially. And I um, had the opportunity to sign with the Braves. I did. I uh, had a pretty good career, played 17 years in the big leagues. Didn't always stay with the Braves. Uh, I was traded to the St. Louis Cardinals and then on to the New York Mets. And, you know, during my uh, playing career, um, I had some, some pretty good years. I won the MVP in 1971 uh, when I was a member of the Cardinals. Uh, led the league in hitting that year. And then I started my managing career with uh, the New York Mets in 1977. Uh, the interesting part is I, I played for three teams. I mentioned them, the Cardinals, the, the Braves, and, and the Mets. And then I managed all three of those teams. And ironically, I got fired by all three of those teams. And, you know, the one thing about, uh, well, I, I think life. I, I call baseball the game of life. You know, basically because it teaches you a lot of life's lessons. You play it every day. Uh, I always felt that I, I don't think I played the game of baseball. I think I lived the game of baseball. Uh, it it uh, was something that always felt brand new to me. Uh, I felt I could always work to get better. And the one thing, especially during the time that uh, you, you're not successful, when I say successful, uh, I did pretty well individually, but the teams I was on have never, you know, reached the World Series, which is really uh, what you play this game to be a part of. It, it, it's a special time. And uh, I finally did uh, with the Yankees in 1996. Um, I think I was the, the only, uh, let me see, how did I, how can I put it? Uh, I, between playing and managing, I went over 4,000 games before I got to a World Series. So I guess you can say that's commitment. Um, you know, it was something I always wanted and it, uh, it wasn't easy. Uh, you know, you had to work hard, you get nothing for nothing. My mom told me that a long time ago. You know, during my playing career, I, um, I really was a leader and I didn't even know it. Uh, I really didn't think about the leadership stuff, but when I was traded to the St. Louis Cardinals, uh, it was I, the second year I was with the Cardinals, they named me captain. So I was saying, wow, the, this club, you know, sees something in me that I don't see in myself. I, I always felt that baseball was a game that you have to prove yourself every day to yourself. Uh, you know, you're always tested, you're out there playing the game and uh, there's somebody out there trying to keep you from doing a good job. Um, managing is where I had the most success. Even though I had a good playing career, uh, managing is, is where it, uh, you know, you sort of reached your goal and you were able to uh, enjoy the fruits of winning. Uh, you know, I managed, uh, first I managed the Mets. You know, we didn't get to a World Series. I managed uh, the Braves. Uh, we did get to the playoffs one year, but I was there three years. We didn't get to a World Series. And I managed the Cardinals uh, for five years. And uh, again, I was, I was uh, fired in, in June of 1995. And as luck would have it, I got a call from the New York Yankees and uh, they were asking if I was interested in being on the short list to be considered to manage the, the Yankees. And I can't say it was a dream come true. I, uh, I never thought of, you know, uh, being with the Yankees. Uh, as a kid, I, I was brought up in New York and there were three teams at the time in New York. You had the, the Dodgers, you had the Giants and you had the Yankees. 
I was a New York Giants fan, which means you had to hate the Dodgers and you had to hate the Yankees. Uh, of course, I turned out that I managed the Dodgers and the Yankees. But in 1996, it was magical for me. You know, my other managing jobs, my, uh, my winning record was, uh, I, I lost over 100 more games than I won as a manager. Uh, that's not very successful. Uh, I think the, the media uh, took my hiring, uh, you know, with a lot of skepticism because they, they, they look at your record and they say, you know, what, a, you know, what made you worthy to manage the Yankees? So I got the opportunity in 1996. I managed the team that had been to the playoffs um, and I was nervous, you know, because now I, you know, I'm, I'm right now I have to find out if I can really do this stuff. Um, and working for George Steinbrenner, uh, who was a very tough boss, but I was excited, you know, even though I was, uh, I was a little uh, nervous about going in, I was excited because I knew George Steinbrenner uh, would spend the money to try to put a winning team on the, on the field. And that first year, we, we certainly in 96, we weren't expected to win uh, uh, as far as getting to the World Series. We, we weren't the favorites. But we, uh, we played well all year, and we got to the World Series. And we uh, played the Braves first two games. Uh, they beat our brains out. And uh, we were down two games to none. And then we were going to uh, Atlanta. And uh, funny story. Uh, it's funny now, anyway. Uh, George Steinbrenner came in my office before game two of the uh, World Series, and we had lost game one and you know, we're ready to play game two. He says, this game is a must. And, you know, I, I was excited about being in the World Series. You know, it was getting to the World Series to me was the most important thing. You know, winning it is something else. Obviously, when you put on a uniform, you want to win a baseball game. Uh, but I said to George, and I was just kidding. I said, George, we may lose tonight because we're facing Greg Maddox, and he's one of the great pitchers in baseball. And our club hadn't played for about eight days because we, you know, we clinched against Baltimore uh, a week before, you know, the World Series started. I said, we haven't played for eight days. I said, we're a little flat and we may lose. I said, but don't worry about it. I said, we're going to go to Atlanta. Uh, that's my town. I said, we'll win three games there and come back and win it for you Saturday night. And I'll be damned. Uh, that's what we wound up doing, but I was just kidding him. Uh, of course, he thought I was a genius and I got an extension on my contract, but that's a story for another day. And it, it was magical for me. Uh, you know, you're, you're sitting in that dugout and this is something that you've really been working for your whole life. And you had an opportunity now to, uh, to be managing the best team in, uh, in the world, basically. So we, we won, uh, we won game three in Atlanta. We won game four in Atlanta. We won a very tough game five in Atlanta. And then uh, game six at home, uh, we, we beat the, uh, we beat the Braves three game, uh, three to two in game six. And we went on to win the world. That was it. We won the world series. And I remember my, my wife, Allie, because she knew that, that the thing I needed to do was win the World Series. And that was going to make my life. It was going to close the circle. It was going to get me where I needed to be. And she said, well, now that you won the World Series, you know, let's retire and go to Hawaii and open up a flower farm and, and all that stuff. I said, let's see if we can do it again. And as it turned out, we, we did it again and again and again. Uh, we didn't win in 97. Uh, we did go to the playoffs, but we, we didn't win. And then in uh, 1998, uh, we won, you know, 114 games in, in, during the regular season and went on to win the World Series 
um, against uh, San Diego. And I, I remember uh, when I was, before I was with the Yankees, I used to watch when teams would win championships, you know, whether it be in football or basketball and, uh, of course, baseball. And, and you always noticed that the following year, it was very tough for those teams, for some reason, to repeat, to do it again. And, you know, you learn every, you learn along the way. I mean, whether you're, you're failing or succeeding, uh, and, and that, that goes for life. Uh, you know, I always felt baseball was a game of life, as I mentioned, that it, it's something that you learn, you, you learn to deal with people and uh, you learn situations, how to you know take care of situations, and and I just um, it, you know baseball was uh, was it, it it wasn't easy. Uh, it felt pretty good when you won, uh, but I used to tell my players, you know, after explaining to them what my reasoning was about the. Um, uh, you know, going and trying to repeat or actually, you know, getting to the promised land again. And I, I realized that even though we were the world champs, uh, you know, in, in order to sustain, you have to get better. I always felt you had to get better to stay the same. Uh, and the reason I felt that way is, is that is you know, when you're uh, one of the top clubs, there's always somebody that's shooting for you. Uh, you know, they'll save their best pitcher for you. Uh, they, they really put on their Sunday best to go out there and try to beat you. So you, you really uh, have to, you know, basically continue to improve. Uh, I had a great ball club. Uh, made up of uh, high character individuals. And what I mean by that, you know, we won, we won the World Series in 96, we won the World Series in 98, we won the World Series in 99, won the World Series in 2000, lost game seven in the ninth inning uh, in 2001. And they just never stop to admire what they have accomplished. And, and I think that's a lesson for all of us uh, in life. Anytime, you know, we, we admire what we've just accomplished, uh, my feeling is that we stop doing it. Uh, you've got to stay hungry, as they used to say, but you, you basically, you know, just have to work at your craft. Uh, in, in our sport, we worked on fundamentals, just the simplest things uh, every single spring because it was important to, to let these players know, the new ones that happen to be with our ball club, that you, you never take it for granted that you can do the little things because that, that's what winning is all about, being able to do the little things. You used to, you went out and you tried to force the other team to beat you because you didn't want to beat yourself. Uh, you wanted to uh, make sure you play the game as best you can. And I remember telling my players uh, in spring training many times, guys, you know, the, the talent out there is about equal. Uh, when things get tough, and uh, the pressure gets ratcheted up a little bit. Uh, Character is the thing that's going to get you through. And by that, I meant uh, I don't want to blame umpires. I don't want to blame bad luck. I just want to go out and play hard, concentrate on what we're doing, and make sure you show up for work every day. I had some good ones. Uh, Derek Jeter, uh, at a very young age, was a high character and still is a high character human being. Uh, he showed the way. His rookie year in, in 1996, he, um, you know, even though he, he was a rookie, uh, by August or September of that first year, 
uh, these older players, the, the veterans on our club, were looking for Derek to do something uh, because that's the kind of confidence they had in him just that developed that, that year, you know, his rookie year. Uh, and he wasn't afraid to fail. And I think it's a lesson for all of us out there. Uh, don't be afraid to fail. You know, failure is, is part of success. I, I, I think if, if you look at uh, whether it's basketball or football, uh, the great ones are the ones that, that are able to get up off the mat and, and go out there and keep, keep fighting for what you really want, what's really important. Baseball is, is something, as, as I said earlier, always felt brand new because I, I always found a way to motivate myself in, in trying to win, trying to put together a team uh, and, and knowing the individuals that you have on that team. Uh, unselfishness is important. Um, you know, we, we play every day of the week, just about six or uh, five or six days a week. And, and you need to, to bring your game every, you know, every single day. Um, players, you know, there's great media in New York. Um, and one of my comments to the players is that it's nice to have the newspaper men at the time uh, but it's nice to have people talk about you in a positive way, that you're a great player, you did a great thing. Uh, I said, what's important, yeah, we know the fans are important, but what's really important is that you're playing for that, that guy in the locker next to you. Uh, because those players that are in the clubhouse with you are the only ones that know how hard it is to do what you do. So you really got to dig down, find a way to, you know, to, to bring it every day. Um, you know, I, as I say, I, I, I think life is a team sport. You can't, you can't, uh, you can't do it by yourself. Um, you know, there are days that you may not, you know, produce, but there's always somebody there to, to pick up for you. Um, I, you know, I, I just feel that, uh, you know, if you're going to be successful, first off, you, you've got to be able to come back from failure and setbacks. It's not easy. It's not easy. I mean, if it was easy, anybody could do it. And I'm talking about success, not necessarily play baseball, but success. Uh, you've got to be resilient. Uh, you, you've got to want something bad enough to make the commitment that uh, nothing's going to get in your way or nothing, nobody's going to stand in your way to keep you from succeeding. Now, you may do everything right, like in our sport. We may go out there and, and play very well. It doesn't guarantee you're going to win. But uh, it, it, it certainly enhances your chances. So... Uh, that's my baseball career. Uh, it's, it's been a thrill for me. Uh, the Yankees made my career uh, by hiring me back in 1996. Um, it was very special. Uh, one other thing uh, that makes me very proud and continues to make me proud is, um, first off, I, I came from a, a family. I'm the youngest of five. Uh, my dad was very abusive to my mom. And um, I was um, a nervous kid growing up, low self-esteem. In fact, I didn't even go out for the high school baseball team when I, as a freshman, because I didn't think I was good enough. Found out later on through some counseling sessions that, uh, you know, what uh, the fear that my dad brought on the house by being abusive uh, is what caused that. And, um, you know, so when we got to New York, uh, my wife, Allie, asked me what charity should we get involved with? And I, uh, we've always gotten involved with children's charities, young people's charities uh, involving, I mean, charities involving young people. Uh, so 
we, uh, I said to Allie, I said, uh, how about domestic violence? Uh, it would sort of caught her off guard, guard because I never really talked about it because I, I, I just kept everything inside. But I'm very proud of the work we do. Uh, we put safe rooms in schools for kids dealing with abuse. And um, we give them the tools to, to make sure that they know that they have a, a bright future ahead of them. Um, so that's so important. But it's been fun talking to you guys. Just go out there, work hard, uh, care for each other, and um, feel good about yourself. Thank you for that great speech. Hey, can you guys still be further apart? Oh, yeah, sure. Murph, do you want to do the next speaker? Or should I? Uh, I, I don't really know. You can. Our next speaker is Eru Matsumoto. She was just recently featured in Forbes 30 Under 30 list. She is a multimedia artist using immersive technology. She is the leading cellist of her generation, one of them. And she recently collaborated with Adele and Demi Lovato, and for that, received a Grammy Award nomination. Wait, are you presenting Eru? I just did! I wanted to present her. Please welcome Eru Matsumoto. I'm an artist. I've been practicing art every day my whole life. I first picked up the cello when I was six years old and every day I trained to master the instrument intensely. And by the time I was 16, I got into Juilliard. My main job as a classical musician day after day was to imagine lots of things. How the composers felt and the very world they had in their minds as they put their pieces on paper. Classical music requires a lot of research into the background of the composers and the era in which the work was written in to help what kind of piano or forte, soft or loud, you're supposed to express for each note. There's even a precise way to put accents and articulate much of the same way an actress would do with their lines of dialogue. As I researched and practiced, researched and practiced many hours a day, I had some time to think. I realized that this art form has existed for over 200 years, and we've developed a complex system which would allow us to perform each piece of music correctly. I began to long for something with a bit more wiggle room, something where I could let my imagination fly more freely. At that time, living in New York, I visited art museums almost every weekend. Strolling the galleries, gazing into paintings and sculptures, I began to wonder what these great works of visual art might sound like. Could there actually be sounds in them? And all we need to do is unlock some kind of codes to be able to hear them. I felt like these paintings must be making beautiful melodies and I could almost hear them when I stopped thinking. Wait. Everything is made up of energies and frequencies, including us. So I could probably figure out what Van Gogh's Starry Night actually sounds like using technology. I ended up figuring out an algorithm which would allow us to play the music of Monet and Miro from Harvard University's private collection. After I presented my findings at Harvard, I began to wonder. I know it's supposed to be silent, but what if the universe itself might make sounds too? Sure enough, outer space is literally filled with a beautiful bouquet of sounds. Fun fact, the Earth is resonating in C sharp. When I began incorporating my cello performance with the sounds from the universe, I thought, wow, now this is super freeing. What greater wiggle room for creativity is there than the universe? And then I started to wonder about those great classical composers and just where do they actually get their inspirations from? Could it be from outer space? What if all these great masters were just a little bit more sensitive, had an antenna, if you will, to catch the music that came from the galaxies themselves? 
And that thought made me super curious to find out just what makes these great masters so great. Music theory is meant to show which harmonies and chords work and why. And we can appreciate how intricate and beautifully written these musical poems are from a theoretical standpoint. But here's the thing, even if we follow the rules of music theory to the letter, we cannot even come close to reproducing these great masterpieces. Which got me wondering. Last year was Beethoven's 250th birthday, so I decided to do a deep dive into his brain. I began to collaborate with an AI company to use deep learning technology to feed the patterns and muscle memories, per se, based on Beethoven's writing, works, historical details of his life, plus all the music that came after him, like jazz, rock, and film scores, to see if we could create something that could be what Beethoven would have written if we were alive today, with a goal of premiering Beethoven's new cello concerto. But the more I thought about what kind of music he would have appreciated, I started to wonder about what format a great artist like Beethoven would have produced their music in. So my next thought was immersive audio, 360 surround sound. After all, we hear music in 3D when we compose, right? It's only the limitation of technology that imposes flat 2D monitoring upon us. With immersive audio, you can sit comfortably in your living room and you're wrapped in the bubble of sound surrounding you. Just imagine what Beethoven and friends would have done with that. Talk about wiggle room to create. And then, well, then the pandemic hit. And just like that, all of my live performances got canceled for the next two years in advance. Really? Two years? Okay, fine. So I did what any self-respecting cellist on a quest to unlock the mysteries of universe would do. Locked myself in my home studio. Although physically I was all alone just sitting in front of my laptop with my cello, I was finally nearly completely free of any limitations or boundaries of any sort. I started designing and composing music for immersive audio and I was able to connect with people from all over the world through this format and, of course, the universal language of music. And that got me wondering about what it was that I wanted people to feel through all of my projects. What it is that connects all human beings and drive us to shape the world in a better way. And it hit me. It was a very simple answer. The power of imagination. Albert Einstein said, imagination is more important than knowledge. I actually think that imagination may be the most important and powerful thing we humans have going for us. There are three different forms of imagination we need to be conscious of in order to master them and unlock this superpower. The first form of imagination is internal imagination. This is your self-image, how you imagine yourself. Internal imagination is the one we use nonstop. In fact, we've used it ever since we were born. It forms who you are and is used to make all sorts of decisions throughout your day without even noticing it. Our values and thoughts and capabilities make up who we are, but how do we come to form these values and thoughts? As infants, we first learn a language, and then we're taught to do things like brushing our teeth every day. There are many habits we repeat so many times in our lives that we don't even think about anymore. For example, when we get up in the morning and go to our closet, we pick out something to wear suitable for what's scheduled that day. We don't ever stop and think about whether we should put clothes on or not. That part is already given, in most cases. Much of our self-worth is based on comparison. We all want to believe that we are special, that we have a purpose in life. We all want to somehow make changes in the world. 
I read that over the past 10 years, the suicide rate at two top tier high schools in Silicon Valley were several times higher than the national average. These kids are expected to be brilliant. They're constantly pushed to achieve extremely high GPAs. The competition is fierce. If one of them were to move and enroll to a typical high school, they will most likely be at the top of their class. And most likely, 90% or more of their daily stress would immediately disappear. We base our value and self-worth on what we know, and that comes from constantly comparing ourselves to those around us. We live our lives without even questioning why we're comparing ourselves or why we do a lot of what we do for that matter. Much of it comes from survival instincts. These do serve a function being on autopilot. We're much safer and happier when we're in the center of a herd or large group being chased by a lion. We feel the same feeling of safety and security when we have many social media followers and likes. Survival instincts gives us a sense of immediate gratification. If we can learn to recognize and control survival instincts, false beliefs and habits, we can be more in touch with something inside us that knows no limits or boundaries. If you harness this power, it can truly be transcendent. You can choose to swap the old self-image or imagination of yourself with something new and exciting. This brings us to our second type of imagination, which is the external form. This imagination extends a little beyond yourself, how you experience the world. Yuval Noah Harari, the author of Sapiens, talks about money being one of the most successful stories ever told. Money in and of itself has no objective value, but then some master storytellers like big bankers and finance people say, hey, look at these pieces of paper. It's actually worth 10 bananas. And it works. Try doing that with chimpanzees. Doesn't work. What's going on is the workings of external imagination. We are told this story generation after generation, and it becomes part of our core belief system. Every organization is made up of many others, all just like us. When you visit a foreign country, you might feel a noticeable difference the moment you step off the plane. And that's directly because of every individual who makes up the collective image of that place. We each imagine ourselves playing certain roles, and we play them really well. But imagine someone who works at a VIP check-in at Ritz-Carlton in Tokyo suddenly transplanted into a grimy gas station off some country road. Can you imagine stopping there for gas and how wonderful the experience could be if that VIP hostess filled your tank? Very hard to imagine, but it makes you think about how we don't typically see or hear people beyond the roles we believe we are playing. But the reality is that we're only limited by what we imagine to be the norm. This world is full of rules that we imagine into existence. But the truth behind the curtain is we're making history together as we live. We are the library. We are the university. We are the governmental body. We are the science. We are the art. We represent our imagination wherever we are. Over the years, I've encountered a whole lot of musicians trying to express their identities in many different ways. In school, I had thought of musicians as healers. We're able to move people's hearts and connect them and spread happiness and love all over the place. But when I got out into the real world, what I began to see were more artists dropping that vision in order to get where they want to be in their career. They imagine that it is more important to do whatever it takes to succeed. Their imagination of a better world is one of them on top at any cost. We need to imagine what we do has a huge effect. We must question why we're doing what we're doing and not simply act out of beliefs that were formed by learned habits or even out of survival instincts. Imagine the community you want to create and represent. 
Imagine the ripple effect you are causing right now and every moment. This starts with how you interact with the very next stranger you meet. When you are operating in a state of inspiration, you're likely to be happier, more grateful, and more attractive. Your eyes light up and you smile wider. And that directly affects the other people you meet. And this brings us to our final form of imagination, which is execution. This imagination means taking the internal imagination of yourself, your new unstoppable self, adding that with your external imagination, how you view the world, and then manifesting or materializing the result. Creating art is super exciting for me. Imagining the sounds in the paintings of Monet or learning that the universe is filled with sounds and being able to hear them, or thinking about what composers like Beethoven may have had in mind as he wrote his Ninth Symphony, or imagining what his latest hit would be with help of deep learning technology. Imagination is limitless, just like the universe, without end. If we start to look, we're able to see people from all over the world pushing boundaries each and every day. Building a suspension bridge or a skyscraper, sending a spacecraft into space and returning it safely onto Earth, or an athlete setting new record every year, making the impossible possible. What is most exhilarating of all for me is seeing people around the world doing what fills them with joy. A person working as a cashier, making kind connections with their customer, a person helping out their friends even they could set them back a bit, random acts of kindness. After all, we feel the best when we feel we have a purpose, and the ultimate satisfaction is doing for others, big or small. And when you are living in the moment of creating beautiful imagination, there's no comparison, there's no resentment, there's no boredom of habitual ruts, there's no sense of deserving more, there's no stepping on others to getting ahead. You may think that being an inspiring person like this requires a mix of good genes, good luck, or at least a financial security. But that's not what it takes at all. A prolific author or painter or composer doesn't wait for the mood to strike in order to do a bit of painting or composing or writing. They know that getting the work done is all about sweat and blood and ass and chair, so to speak. As Thomas Edison is reported to have said, genius is 1% inspiration, 99% perspiration. The execution is most often where the hard work comes, but even that part of the process utilizes imagination. So if you've got something to say or something to create, you've got three different forms of imagination working for you right now. The best moment to execute is now. Be the imagination you wish to see in this world. Thank you very much. As drone reinforcement seed guns. Yeah, I'm shooting seeds into the ground at really high speeds in order to help with reforestation. Our next speaker, Bryce Jones, in his early 20s, witnessed firsthand the lack of technology and reforestation. So Bryce is now the founder and CEO of Canada's first drone reforestation company, Flash Forest, and plans to plant a billion trees by 2028 and not stop there. Please welcome Bryce Jones. You can't solve climate change. And these are the words that my engineering prof told me when he found out about my startup. I said, what do you mean? And he said it again. You can't solve climate change. I realized there's three possible reasons that he would have said this. One, he believes that climate change is a hoax. Two, he believes that climate change is too big to be solved by a human. Or three, he believes that climate change is too big to be solved by me. Now, I'm not gonna tell you that an individual can single-handedly solve the climate crisis. But I hope that by the end of this talk, you're gonna be more convinced that you as an individual have 
enormous power to change the future of the planet, to influence the future of the planet. And I'll even go a step further to say that the future health of the planet and the species that we share it with depend on actions by individuals like you and me to take it into our own hands. And I'll tell you how. So let's take a look at the problem. I live in Toronto, Canada, and here winters are getting warmer. We're getting midwinter heat waves. Spring is coming sooner and summers are getting hotter, longer and drier. In fact, 2020 was tied with 2016 as the hottest year on record globally, according to NASA. Now let's zoom out. Imagine you're in the vacuum of space. Everywhere you look around you, it's barren, it's inhospitable. Imagine you're put on a rocky planet like Mars, for example. Every rock and grain of Martian dust is completely void of life. In fact, it's the same story everywhere that we look in the solar system. As far as we know, at this point in 2021, Earth is the only place that contains life. Not only that, but it's where we evolved and we've adapted to it fantastically. The atmosphere shields the, the most harmful solar radiation. The magnetic field shields us from solar storms. The air is rich, rich in oxygen. The gravity at sea level is 1G. It couldn't be more perfectly suited for human life. And relative to anything else that we see in the solar system, the Earth is an oasis. And I think it's important to look at it in that way. Now, when I'm standing on the surface and I look up at the atmosphere, it is a vast body that seemingly extends forever. But from the point of view of, say, the International Space Station, you can just see how remarkably thin the atmosphere really is. Say you magically place a road on the surface of the Earth that extends perpendicular up into space. Um, ignoring the laws of physics, if you drive on this road at a comfortable 100 kilometers an hour or 60 miles per hour, you'll reach space within one hour. Not only that, but you'll pass through about 80% of the atmosphere within 15 minutes. So I hope that just gives you a picture for just how thin the atmosphere really is. Now the CO2 concentration, the global atmospheric CO2 concentration at the time of this talk is 416.75 parts per million. For reference, over the last 800,000 years, there hasn't been one point where we've passed 300 parts per million. This is taken from ice samples in polar regions. One study by Nature suggests that the last time CO2 was over 400 parts per million was during the mid-Pliocene era, about 3.3 million years ago, where at its highest, sea levels were up to 20 meters higher than they are today. Uh, this was caused by a significant melting of the Greenland and Antarctic ice sheets. Amsterdam, Miami, the whole of Bangladesh would have been underwater, except for a small portion. Choose your favorite coastal city. 50 million years ago, there were alligators and tortoises in the Arctic Circle. So the Earth has been warmer, the Earth can get warmer, and the Earth is getting warmer. Although the Earth has had natural and gradual fluctuations in temperature over the eons, the warming that is happening today is for another reason. So imagine you look at a graph. You have time in the x-axis and you have CO2 and you have global temperature rise in the other axis. You can see a direct correlation between CO2 emissions from about 150 years ago up to today. Kind of looks like this and it's going nowhere but up. There's a resounding agreement within the scientific community that humans are the cause of the warming that we're seeing today. So now that this is clear, we have a problem. Thank you. I'm joking. Now let's talk about solutions. We need to get to net zero carbon emissions by 2050. According to the IPCC or the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, Countries around the world are going to need to decarbonize significantly in order to prevent a 1.5 degrees Celsius warming. Preventing a warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius is going to require mass innovation. The entire technological structure of our society is intrinsically linked to fossil fuels. This is going to require mass innovation in all major carbon emitting sectors. Energy production and distribution, transportation, agriculture, heating and cooling units, material production, especially concrete and steel and of course, pulling excess carbon out of the atmosphere that already exists. This is gonna be hard, and I predict it's gonna be the global challenge of the 21st century. But the good news is that countries around the world have now recognized and are seriously committed to solving this problem. In 2015, 191 countries signed COP21, or the Paris Agreement, uh, legally binding them to reduce their emissions uh, drastically to prevent a 1.5 degrees Celsius warming above pre-industrial levels by 2050. With commitment 
comes financial investment. In Biden's climate and environmental justice proposal, the U.S. will contribute $1.7 trillion over the next 10 years to a clean energy economy plan. Now, of course, political commitments have a flaky track record and they need to be followed through. But the point here is that money is now being allocated towards climate solutions and on a colossal scale. It's never been seen before. Now, let's talk about startups. In recent years, there are startups that have gone from inception to a $1 billion valuation within three years. There's other startups that have reached 1 billion users global wide within five years. And I believe that this is gonna be surpassed soon. Startups grow unfathomably fast in 2021. Let me mention a few uh, global reaching startups that are spearheading the climate fight. Burgers for meat lovers made entirely from plants. Uh, fully electric vehicles for basically anyone. CO2-infused cement that makes an even stronger concrete product. Or seaweed-infused cattle feed that reduces methane emissions by about 80%. And my company, we use drones to plant trees. By scaling reforestation, we scale carbon sequestration. And since trees are the most effective means that we currently have of pulling carbon out of the atmosphere, this is where we're making our dent on the climate crisis. We set a mid-term goal of planting 1 billion trees by 2028, but we don't plan to stop there. Not too long ago, in summer 2019, with an idea and enough insanity to give it a shot, we modified a drone, and with the cooler we were shooting frozen gelatin-coated pods with tree seeds and soil mix into the grass in my friend's backyard. We got a proof of concept, we launched a Kickstarter campaign, and the company started taking off. Since then, our tech has changed drastically and we're now scheduled to plant hundreds of thousands of trees across the country, partnered with some of Canada's largest forestry companies. Soon we're gonna be moving internationally. My experience in this company over the last two years has taught me a few things. One, people care. They wanna do something. They just don't know where to put their energy. Two, startups grow unfathomably fast in 2021. And three, Individuals like you and me have a seriously disproportionate influence on the future of the planet. So to bring this full circle, let's put any lingering climate debate behind us. Humans are responsible for the climate crisis that we're in today. Uh, we have in the order of decades, not centuries, to figure this out. And that puts a lot of responsibility on us, on our generation, to create the future of the planet that we want. I envision this as a future that is sustainable. And by sustainable, that means one that will last. I find that extremely exciting. By joining or starting a climate-driven company with an audacious goal, you can play a key role in creating that future. Some good questions to ask are, what are some alternatives to this carbon-intensive process that don't currently exist? How could this technology be electrified? In the words of Jocko, how do you get up before 5 a.m.? You get up before 5 a.m. In my words, how do you do something about the climate? you do something about the climate. I'll leave you with this thought. You have the power to take an idea in your head and make it real. If you do this, the future will thank you. Oh, hey, Camille. What's up, Murph? Do you think we're COVID safe? Yeah, I think we're good. Do you mind doing the next presenter? Yeah. Our next presenter is Gary Shang. Gary is the founder of Civics Unplugged, a program focused on channeling Gen Z's passion, creativity, and idealism towards rebuilding and reforming America's democracy. I can't wait to use it. Please welcome Gary Shang. It was 2017. I had just gotten promoted to becoming a software engineering lead at Google, building the future of its cloud services. Outside of work, I had a crazy active social life in New York City. It wasn't unusual for me to be going to multiple parties and concerts on any given week. Not to mention, I was making a lot of money. Maybe a little too much for my maturity level. I felt like I had every reason to be happy. But for the most part, I was actually miserable. Of course, I didn't admit that to anyone, much less myself. I was one of those guys that if you asked me how they were doing, they would just say, I'm doing great. But in reality, I felt an emptiness inside. 
which was really confusing to me because Google was supposed to be my dream job. I mean, there were a few days that were happier than the day that I got my job at Google in the spring of 2015. That day, I felt like I made it. I would finally have what I need to be happy. I had spent most of my time in college at Duke, and arguably my whole life, working up to that point. Exam after exam, project after project, internship after internship, working my way to the point of securing one of those highly coveted jobs at what was the gold standard for computer science majors. But back to 2017, I never could have predicted that just two years after getting my job at Google, I would be miserable. And that just two years later, in May of 2019, I would decide to quit. So why in the world would I leave what was at one point my dream job? Let me explain. My decision to quit Google was years in the making. And it started in 2016, when America's divisive presidential election woke me up to America's fragility and downward trajectory. I had previously been extraordinarily complacent about the state of where the country was headed, but it had become increasingly clear that our political system, regardless of which major party was in power, was the source of so many problems in America. I was naive and out of touch, probably because I was so focused on getting promoted, on making more money, on going to increasingly exclusive parties. I also assumed that civilizational stability and progress was somewhat inevitable, and that just about everyone was benefiting from the rapid changes in our global economy. But that just couldn't have been further from the truth. Just because the stock prices of companies like Google are soaring doesn't mean that humanity is flourishing. Between 2016 and 2019, I spent thousands of hours catching up on what I should have known long ago. I devoured books and podcasts. I talked to social entrepreneurs, scientists, activists, bankers, heads of Fortune 100 companies, just trying to make sense of what was happening. And all signs pointed to the following. First, that humanity faces extraordinary challenges that threaten not only civilization, but our species survival. Our fates are bound together, as demonstrated by the consequences of pandemics, climate change, global economic disparities, growing political polarization, and more. If we cannot come together and act as one species to address our collective challenges, our future will be grim at best. The second thing that my journey taught me was that I was not doing nearly enough to realize my potential to help address these challenges in the US and around the world. As cool as I thought it was to build products that had the potential to affect millions of people, I knew that I needed to be doing more for humanity than just marginally increasing Google's top line. While I knew that my values were changing, le leaving Google was not easy. I loved so many of the people there and the money was really good. And I'm not going to lie, it was really painful to leave the free food. <laughs> There was a donut bar, a smoothie bar, a ramen bar, all you can eat. And anyone that knows me knows that I love to eat, but I knew that I would have to make sacrifices in order to push humanity forward. But where would I go after Google? What would I do? Realizing that you're not doing enough for humanity is not the same thing as knowing what to do next. So I went on a journey to identify what I call my U-shaped hole. In other words, my place in the world where my passions and talents met humanity's greatest needs. I first looked at my passions and realized that I had fallen in love with learning about all things about developing people, communities, and societies. I then identified my superpowers I was really tech savvy, good at synthesizing and explaining information from different disciplines, and had a knack for bringing people together into community to get things done. I then assessed humanity's greatest needs. And although there are many that deserve our attention, during that process, I kept coming back to one need, 
The need for democracy reform. I saw that social media had become increasingly toxic. Our democratic institutions had dramatically eroded and our elected officials at every level seemed neither willing nor able to get anything done. I also saw that Generation Z, the generation that will represent 25% of the voting population by 2030, was not getting what it needed to realize its potential to build the future of democracy. From there, I needed to figure out where the passions that I had identified, the superpowers that I had discovered, and the need for democracy reform would meet. And that would take some time. When I began telling people that I was contemplating breaking what are infamously called Google's golden handcuffs, I got a ton of pushback from friends and family members. Many thought that I was going through a phase, that I wasn't thinking clearly, that I was crazy to want to give up that cushy job at Google. One of my closest friends from Duke said to me, I don't think you should spend much time thinking about the problems in the world. You're not going to be able to do much about those things. It's a lot safer to just focus on yourself and make a bunch of money. I disagreed. Reflecting on what my friend had said, I realized that I wouldn't have been able to live with myself, knowing that there was a way that I could make the world a better place, but I decided to instead take the easy path and get rich while watching humanity's problems get worse. But in order to convince my family and friends and fully convince myself that it made sense to leave Google, I needed to find people that were willing to go all in with me. Luckily, at the beginning of 2019, after years of networking and learning, I met an eclectic intergenerational group of hopeful do-gooders who saw what I saw. The need and opportunity to empower young people to take the future of democracy into their own hands. It was meeting these people, my eventual Civics Unplugged co-founders, that finally gave me the courage to quit my job. They taught me something very important. Democracy can't wait. Why must we urgently act to save our democracy? The challenges we face, including the climate crisis, skyrocketing inequality, and rising geopolitical tensions are very real and complex. And all of them deserve a great deal of time and attention. But if we don't prioritize reforming and revitalizing our democracy, America will sink under the weight of these great challenges because these challenges all require some kind of government action to solve. Addressing these challenges will require the kind of creative leadership, nuanced thinking, and hard trade-offs that binary toxic politics subverts. It will require a political system that incentivizes partisan leaders to make the complicated, multi-dimensional compromises that are needed. A nation divided cannot solve these big problems. If we don't get the politics right, we're not gonna get the policies right. As political reform expert Lee Drutman once said, America's winner-take-all electoral rules are the antiquated cracking levees of a political system that is flooding with toxic conflicts. If we don't fix the underlying structural issues and channel conflict better, everything else is just taking buckets to a flood. So how does Civics Unplugged reform and revitalize our democracy? CU channels Gen Z's passion, creativity, and imagination towards reforming and rebuilding their political systems. Over the course of the decade, CU will provide training, funding, and community for tens of thousands of Gen Z leaders devoting themselves to building the future of democracy. Along the way, these democracy builders will inspire millions to follow in their footsteps. While we are only on year two of our journey, we are off to a strong start. Our community, which is a mini democracy of its own, led by a group of community elected representatives, consists of almost a thousand Gen Z leaders from every state in the US and now over 40 countries around the world. And we've been recognized by CBS This Morning, Nickelodeon, Reuters, and even Forbes 30 Under 30. I'm proud to say that unlike in 2017, 
I'm happy. I really am. I feel like where I'm at with Civics Unplugged is my U-shaped hole. My place in the world where my passions and my superpowers meet humanity's greatest needs. But as cool as the work we're doing is, we obviously cannot build the future alone. I'm here to tell you, humanity needs you. Maybe you're stuck in what you imagine would be your dream job and you're having second thoughts. Maybe you're like how I was in 2017, seeing problems in the world and feeling like you're not realizing your potential to do something about them. Maybe you're recognizing that just like democracy can't wait, climate change can't wait, or transforming education can't wait. Here's the thing, no matter what you love to do, no matter what your talents are, you have the power to make a difference in the world. You have the power to be the source of so many people's upward spirals. You don't have to create a democracy reform organization to begin taking responsibility for humanity's future. And it really may not make sense for you to quit your job, but recognize that no matter where you want to channel your passions and superpowers, you will have to change yourself to change the world. My own story illustrates this point. Before co-founding CU, my journey toward taking responsibility for humanity's future started with myself. In 2018, I was definitely not plugged into my U-shaped hole. I was unsatisfied at work, and outside of work, I was harming my body. I wasn't working out, I was addicted to Twitter, and I was addicted to partying. 2018 was the year where in one period I drank for 28 days straight. And I actually bragged about that streak to friends, probably because I needed to justify my embarrassing and unsustainable lifestyle. Recognizing that the change I wanted to see in the world wouldn't happen until I changed myself. I decided at the beginning of 2019 to quit drinking cold turkey. I was tired of spending my time devoted to partying and not my purpose. Killing my drinking habit sparked inside me an upward spiral. Shortly after, I started running, then journaling, then meditating, then regularly sleeping eight hours a day, then cutting out sugary drinks. The list goes on. In just a few months, I was functioning at a level that was three to four X higher than I was performing in 2018. I was a better thinker, friend, brother, son, colleague, and human. I was happier and healthier than ever before, and seeing all this change in myself helped give me confidence to leave Google and change the world. But what do we mean at CU when we talk about changing the world? While we have had the privilege of supporting successful democracy reform efforts around the US, what I'm actually most proud of is the difference we've been able to make in the lives of the kids in our community. One of the ways that we invest in our kids is by doing what we like to call one-on-ones. Once a week meetings where team members such as myself meet with a kid to just find out how are they doing and how can we be helpful. These one-on-ones are usually only 10 to 15 minutes but they make a huge difference in our kids' lives. It's amazingly energizing for any person, especially a kid, to have someone in their life who actually listens to them, allows them to not be put together, sees them for the complex human that they are, and affirms that, yeah, life right now is pretty disorienting. In a time of masks, both literally and figuratively, Allowing people to just be and take their time to adapt to this ever-changing world is revolutionary. One of our kids who created an amazing virtual summer camp for hundreds of our peers last year sent this to me the other day. Empowerment is such a buzzword, but CU is the definition of empowering. 
The team and community have instilled in me the confidence to lead projects that can really make a difference in people's lives. If CU is any indication of what democracy is supposed to feel like, let's spread the love everywhere. For me, seeing what happens when these kids plug into their U-shaped holes, seeing the magic that is created when they step into their potential, that's priceless. I'll leave you with this. Imagine what the world could be if everyone was plugged into their U-shaped holes, doing everything they could to be the person they could be for themselves and for their colleagues, classmates, friends, and family. Imagine all the second and third order effects all of these inspired, empowered people could create for our communities, our country, and our world. Imagine that future. That future is possible. And no pressure, but it starts with you. Your Honor, if the court allows, may I please present to the next TEDx speaker? Overruled. But you've presented a lot of them. Objection! Like, statistically, you've done like four in. Mr. Murphy, one account of a co contempt to you. This is a classroom. Our next speaker is Beth Holly. Beth Holly is the Senior Vice President, Associate General Counsel, and Chief Compliance Officer of Regeneron Pharmaceuticals, a leading science and technology company delivering life transforming medications for serious diseases. Prior to Regeneron, Beth spent 13 years at Pfizer, where she served on various positions in the legal department. Please welcome Beth Holly. Hi, I'm Beth Holly, and I'm here to talk about how I found my place in the, the legal profession. I graduated law school in 1988. It was a time of big hair and big shoulder pads. Women's fashion required us to wear suits with skirts and stockings, high heels, and these dreadful floppy bows called pussy bows. Not our best moment. And men really dominated the profession. Even though 50% of my graduating class from law school was women, when I got to a law firm, I quickly saw that most, if not all, of the partners in the firm were men. And the culture was definitely geared towards men. And there were several um, incidents that happened during my time at a law firm that really showed me for the first time that my gender could actually be an impediment in this profession. For example, I, I attended a client meeting um, in a boardroom at a law firm. Um, and it was this beautiful big boardroom at the top floor of the building. And at some point I needed to use the restroom. Well, there was no ladies restroom on that floor. In fact, I had to walk down a back staircase to the secretary's bathroom on another floor. This was in the late 1980s. I had a, a female colleague of mine who attended a closing dinner for a big deal that she had been working on. And when she got to the location of the event was told that the, the, the um, place didn't admit women. And so she was asked to leave. And no partner stood up and said, no, 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 well, then we'll go somewhere else or insist that she stay. She just left. And even at my own firm, when it came time for the holiday party, my invitation was addressed to Mr. and Mrs. with my husband's full name. I never got the invitation because the mailroom didn't know where to send it. There was no one by that name at the firm. And things only got worse after I had my first child. You know, being a successful litigator at the firm and billing a lot of hours, which was incompatible with the kind of parent that I wanted to be. And in fact, the, the firm offered a mommy track option for women who wanted to work part time. And it's astonishing to me that without any hesitation, the, the deal that they offered women was to work four days a week for three fifths pay. You know, we talk about pay equity now, and just imagine being expressly told, we're gonna to ask you to work four out of five days, but we're only gonna pay you for three. Certainly that was not a deal I was willing to take. 
And so it was around that time that I began to explore other options. Because the law firm, the things that the law firm valued weren't necessarily what I valued. The law, law firm valued hard work, which I'm all for, really long hours, because it was all about the billable hours. And it really was about this kind of boys club camaraderie that I didn't feel a part of. And what was lacking from law firm values was leadership. And leadership was something I was very interested in. And so I decided to look for an in-house role, being in-house counsel to a company where I might be able to have more control over my schedule and might find a role that allowed me to bring my whole self into the job in an environment that valued what I valued. So I landed at Pfizer. Um, at the time, I didn't know anything about the company. I didn't know anything about healthcare law. I learned it on the job. And I was fortunate to have as my boss, someone who became my mentor, who told me early on, took me aside and said, Beth, you need to understand that you're not in the law business anymore. You're in the pharmaceutical business. And that really signaled an important mind shift that proved to be fundamental to the way I've become a lawyer ever since that time. Because being an in-house lawyer means really understanding the business that you're in and being able to partner with your client, who is your company, on achieving their business objectives. And that's something that outside lawyers don't often do because they are not as embedded in the business that they are supporting. The other thing that the in-house role offered me was this opportunity for leadership. Pfizer was excellent in developing really strong leaders and invested in leadership training for people that they felt had potential. And it was at that company that I first learned how to be a leader and learned that I love leading other people. I spent 13 years at that company and then left and have now spent 12 years at Regeneron. And if you're familiar with both of those names in the COVID space, it is something that is very gratifying to me to have been a part of two companies that have been so important in the current COVID battle that we're under, that we are waging right now. And I'll come back to that in a moment. But I love being an in-house lawyer. And it requires a different skill set than that than outside counsel requires. You know, for outside counsel, your job is really to be an expert on the law, to, 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 to turn, turn over every leaf to find the argument or the case law or the language for a deal that meets your client's needs. You are asked to be, to be deep, have deep knowledge and expertise and to advise your client on what the law says and what their options might be. But being an in-house lawyer is a little bit different. As I mentioned, you really have to have a business mindset. You have to invest the time and energy to fully understand your business. You have to have the ability to think on your feet because you, unlike being in a law firm, you won't have the time to go off to the library to do a lot of research or ask an associate to write you a memo on a topic. You're gonna need to make judgment calls in the moment, which means using common sense and your past experience, being creative in finding solutions to problems and challenges, being agile and being able to shift from one issue to another. I, my my uh, responsibilities span half a dozen different subject areas of the law. So there's always something new that you need to be adapting to. You have to know how to deal with ambiguity because it's an ever shifting landscape and you don't always know exactly where things are going to land, what the facts are, where they're going to be, what, what decisions the business is gonna make that you're going to need to adapt to. And you have to really have a drive to get things done, to deliver results. We don't sit back and, and advise somebody else and let them make the decision. We're involved in the decisions. Now I'm chief compliance officer at Regeneron, which means I'm responsible for our ethics and compliance program. So integrity is key to what we do. And, and integrity is critically important in the research that we do, in the manufacturing that we do, in the business that as it operates, integrity is just integral to that effort. So being a part of that and drawing on my own personal integrity has been a big part of how I operate as an in-house lawyer. And finally, just talking about leadership, because I've mentioned that a couple of times. You know, when, when you are um, in an in-house environment, 
as I mentioned, leaders get rewarded, people get rewarded by with leadership responsibilities, and you get a chance to um, convey your knowledge and your understanding to the next generation of leaders. And I have found that that has been a very rewarding part of the way I operate as a lawyer in my jobs. So the, the opportunity that you have as an in-house lawyer to marry your legal knowledge, your business knowledge, your personal um, your personal strengths, for me, integrity, creativity, um, commitment to getting things done, with the ability to lead others in the same fashion is a privileged space that I have been really very fortunate um, to have landed on as a way of being a lawyer. And, and both Pfizer and Regeneron gave me the opportunity to hone these skills, which really prepared me for 2020. Because when 2020 hits and COVID-19 comes onto the horizon, um, all of those skills needed to be brought to bear. Regeneron was, um, played a key role um, in trying to find a treatment for COVID-19. Um, this was something that Regeneron was ready to do. We had um, been investing in our research uh, uh, technologies for many, many years. And just a few years ago, we're critical in finding a cure for the Ebola virus by devising an antibody cocktail that, that married two different antibodies to be able to treat that infectious disease. And so when we first learned about the coronavirus pandemic that was beginning in China in early 2020, our research teams immediately took the skills that they learned in fighting Ebola to try to fight and find a cure for COVID-19. And as they were doing that and operating with a great sense of urgency, that's when I first was able to really leverage the deep knowledge of the business that I had previously invested in. Invested in because that allowed us to move quickly to address any legal issues in real time. And one of the things that I've done over the course of my career, which is really important for an in-house role, is building relationships of trust with your business partners and to establish yourself, not as a roadblock to their success, but actually as a business enabler, because that gives us a seat at the table where the decisions are being made in real time and gives us the opportunity then to really add value by identifying potential roadblocks and finding ways to eliminate, it, eliminate them, to find new paths that might be new ways to use the law to our advantage that might be helpful in achieving the business objective. And in this case, of really having a direct impact on a global pandemic. And those skills that I talked about, collaboration, agility, came into, um, into high demand. So for instance, even while our research efforts were focused on trying to find a cure for COVID-19, the rest of our business was still going on. We were doing clinical trials in a whole, for a whole range of new products. And we needed to figure out how do we adapt those clinical trials for the fact that people are, are in lockdown? How do we continue to monitor them for safety without traveling to clinical sites around the world to uh, observe things in real time? And the same token for our commercial organization, we have several products that are approved and we have a field force of sales representatives across the United States who routinely go into doctor's offices to talk to them about the products. Well, they were suddenly going to be locked down as well and doing that from their homes. So we had to quickly adapt our compliance policies and our practices to enable virtual engagement. And at the same time, we're really dealing with ambiguity because we are in a new area of law. You, know, you may have heard the term emergency use authorization, which is the regulatory mechanism by which both the vaccines that Pfizer um, and other companies have developed and the treatment that Regeneron has developed, how those are being made available to people. It's not a full um, FDA approval, but an emergency use authorization for use in a pandemic. This had never been used for drugs before. Um, and certainly I had never had any experience with it. So part of it is quickly figuring out what is an EUA? How do we get one? If we get one, what does that mean? How can we operate? We're diving in and the lawyers were critical to that effort. And then I talked a little bit about the drive to get things done. And that was really important because myself and my team, we were already working at 110% before this started. 
And now I needed to bring on another 110% of work um, on top of that. So how do we marshal all of our resources and have the stamina to deliver on emerging issues while still maintaining um, the support necessary for existing activities? And so in, as we, as we are um, doing all these things so quickly, we can't lose our focus on integrity because we, to, as, to put a product out in the marketplace, particularly one that hasn't had the benefit of a full FDA approval, people need to trust. And people can only trust when they know that the company behind that is trustworthy, is being transparent about um, their information, is maintaining a focus on quality and compliance and integrity while doing this as quickly as we could. And as chief compliance officer, that was part of my role was ensuring that while we moved as quickly as we could, we were not cutting corners. And then the last part about, about this that I wanna talk about is that, you know, in mid-March of last year, suddenly I was no notice, my entire team of 40 people were told, pack up what you can, go home, don't know how long you're gonna be working from home. And of course, we still don't know, it's been over a year now. And so as a, this is where my leadership skills were really, really brought to the fore because I needed to somehow become the glue that held this group together while we were physically apart. And emotional leadership became a really big part of that. It was really necessary to understand the challenges that people were facing. Some who had family members who were struck ill by COVID-19, even people who were at a great distance, Others who are quickly trying to figure out how do they um, manage schooling for their children who are now going to be having school at home, or those who had children who weren't school age and don't have childcare anymore. How do we support them, these people, to deal with the stresses of these new arrangements? So I started having biweekly meetings with my team that were really not about business matters so much as they were about human matters. Like, how do we support each other through this? And we did some really fun and creative things. You know, we started having these biweekly meetings where we would have a photo challenges, a face, back, face mask challenge, where I had everybody send me a picture in their favorite face mask or a, a pet <laughs> pandemic pet parade where people who had gotten pets um, during the pandemic were sharing pictures of them, things like that. And then we did, we brought in a magician that did a magic show one day and a trivia game, another. And while these things seemed light and fun, they proved to be really critical in making people feel connected and cared for. And that in turn enabled them to continue giving to support the growing business need. And the other part that really emerged during this was the importance of authenticity in leadership. And I have always been a fairly transparent person and I share a lot of information about myself. Um, everybody I work with knows the names of my kids and what they're doing and my dogs. And um, I like to bring all of those parts of me into the workplace. And I wanna welcome other people to do the same, to make sure that they feel safe and able to, to bring those parts of themselves into their professional life. And so last summer when the, um, after George Floyd was tragically murdered um, and there was an uprising, a much needed uprising on um, equal justice issues, I chose to talk about that quite directly with my team. Um, and, and, and I got deeply involved in our diversity, equity and inclusion issues um, at Regeneron. Letting people know that I cared about these things went a long way to making them feel safe and secure and connected and, and frankly valued. And you know, oftentimes people think about leadership as soft skills, you know, that you've got your core hard skills, your, you know, your business skills, your legal skills, and then those soft skills. But the, the so-called soft skills are not soft. They're, they can be difficult to acquire and they are incredibly important. And for me, being able to integrate the who I am and the how I show up in the world with the things that I know and the skills that I have is how I bring my whole self into the workplace. So when I think back on what this year has been like and, and, and in fact, what my career has been like because I've now been at this for, um, for over 30 years, 
there's a few kind of key takeaway lessons that I want to share with you. One is that there are lots of ways to be a lawyer, and I'm sure lots of ways to be all kinds of other professionals that, that you know, in fields that you may be interested in. And the key to me is finding the path that serves all parts of you, a place where you can be the professional that you want to be, the parent, the partner, all, all of those parts of you need to be served and finding a role that allows you to, to support and express all those dimensions of yourself is really important. And I also learned that in my role, the more that I show my authentic self in the workplace, the more effective I am and the more successful I am at inspiring others to greater heights. And I realized that the, my strengths of, as a woman have been key to my success. Things like empathy and authenticity, compassion, and frankly, the overall ability to get stuff done. You know, we don't need to hide these so-called feminine qualities to be successful. In fact, it's my belief that the more we integrate the personal and professional dimensions of ourselves, the more effective that we are. So as I leave you here today, I'll leave you one parting wish, which is that you too find an opportunity for yourself that allows you to bring all of yourself to your profession, because we are not one dimensional beings. And we, if you can find a place that welcomes all of your dimensions, I'm sure that you will have both personal and professional success. Thank you. What's up guys, Murph coming back at you with another presentation intro. This time we're presenting filmmaker and YouTuber Jack Coyne. Get out of town, what else does he do? Did you know he was the first employee of social media startup Beam? Uh, well now I do. Did you know he spent a year working for CNN as the host and producer of Beam News' YouTube channel? No, I didn't. Did you know he has over 170,000 subscribers and a million views on his YouTube channel? That's crazy! We now present Jack Coyne. Hello, Wake Forest. It's great to be back with you. I actually spent the night at Wake in 2012 during my spring break. I went to a frat party and a bar. I don't remember what either was called, but I had a great time, and that's one of the main reasons I agreed to do this talk. I'll get into that story a little later, but the point is, not too long ago, I was in college in a very similar position to you all. I didn't know what I was gonna be when I grew up. I still don't, to be honest, but I always thought it was cool to hear from older folks what their careers were, how they ended up there, and maybe some lessons they learned along the way. And now I look in the mirror and I realize I'm the old guy. So my name's Jack Coyne and I make YouTube videos for a living. That's not a career that my parents or my college professors really understand, but I imagine it's something that people your age totally do understand. Now, just saying that I make YouTube videos is a major simplification of my job. I don't have millions of subscribers or viewers. I don't get paid to take part in pay-per-view boxing matches. I don't get to give away Teslas to my friends, but I do get to spend my days doing what I love. And that's the important part of this talk. I wanna tell you about my career and some of the steps I took along the way to get to a place where I have a job that I love. And I want you to spend all your days doing what you love. So whether or not your dream job is to be a YouTuber or has anything to do with social media, I think that there are some lessons in here that might be valuable to you. My goal in this spill the tea talk is to be as transparent and forthcoming as possible because I think that's how you'll learn the most from me. So right now in April, 2021, I'm 30 years old. I graduated college in 2013. And two weeks later, I started my first post-collegiate job. And at the time I thought, okay, Jack, this is your first job. You'll go from this one to the next job, to the next job, to the next job until it's time to retire. And I thought this because that's what my parents did. And that's what all the older people I knew did. And that's what you see on TV and everything else. But as of today, I haven't had a job in a little over three years. If you told me when I was 22, I'd be pretty freaked out, but now, I'm very comfortable with it. I actually hope I never have to have a job again. So what happened? In short, I got fired from my last job and I was faced with a major inflection point in my career. You never know when one of these career altering moments is gonna come up, when you'll have to make a major decision about what to do next. But you do have your past experiences, 
lessons you've learned, people you admire, and your willingness to take a risk that can guide you in the right direction. I'll tell you more about that decision that I made a little later, but first let's go back to the beginning of my career so I can tell you everything that led up to that inflection point and some of the lessons that I learned along the way. I became interested in working in film when I was in high school. I got really into the movie Goodfellas and I was like, I wanna make stuff like this because movies made me happy. Movies and entertainment make a lot of people happy. I went to a liberal arts school called Wesleyan in Connecticut because they had this super nice movie theater and a pretty good film program and that's what I wanted to do. I majored in film studies and economics. Summer after my freshman year, I wanted to get an internship in the film industry, but I was having trouble finding something. But I, there was this ad that I kept seeing on the buses in New York for a, for a new HBO show called The Neistat Brothers. On the poster it said, a homemade TV show. This caught my attention. A couple weeks later, I watched the first episode of the show and immediately realized that this was the type of filmmaking I could get into. I knew I needed to work with these guys. So the question was, how do I get my foot in the door? What kind of email can I write that will make them say, okay, let's give this kid a shot. And this is one of the most important lessons I learned early on in my career and something I've thought about a lot when hiring people. I made the conversation completely about what I could do to make their lives easier. Instead of thinking about or worrying about how this was gonna benefit me, I thought, how can I show you in this email that I'm just going to make your life and your job easier and ask for nothing in return? So I wrote that I admired their work and in order to help, I'd love to come in and basically mop the floors and clean up and do whatever little things around the office that would make it easier for them to do their jobs. And, and then I'd do it for free. The reason I was willing to do this without asking for anything in return was because I knew I'd gained a lot just by being in the same room as these people, just by learning from observation. How does someone work once you get a peek behind the curtain? My objective was to make like a sponge and absorb as much information as possible. Pretty quickly, a funny thing happened. I was given the opportunity to do a little more each day. If you're working hard for someone, even at something as menial as sweeping up, they'll start to notice and realize there's probably more that you can do. There are a few important lessons here. One is that if you wanna get something from someone professionally, first figure out what you can do for them. Two is that you learn a lot just by being in the room. So figure out how to get in the room. Three is that you shouldn't think of yourself as too good for a certain type of job. Showing a high degree of care and dedication to even small menial tasks is an exercise in discipline that's helpful in all aspects of your life. One of the most important things I learned in that early internship was the importance of doing things to learn. At the time I was studying film, I had these dreams of being a Hollywood filmmaker, but I had no clue how to make movies, really. It was just, it was this first summer gig that inspired me to get my head out of the books and actually try and make stuff. You're never going to be a filmmaker unless you actually start making films. And it was a summer of watching these guys constantly making these little films that made me realize I needed to start doing this too. I needed to pick up the camera and start making things. And I think that this separated me from a lot of the other kids in my class. I spent a huge amount of my time outside of class trying to make these little videos just for fun. And most of them were really, really, really bad. And the thing is, it's embarrassing to make something and have it suck. And that's why we come up with excuses to not make something. Because it's much easier to imagine how great your work would be if it wasn't for the million excuses that we make up. But you learn a lot more from making something that sucks than not making something that might be great. The more these crappy things you make, you'll slowly realize you're getting better. More importantly, you're learning skills along the way. In college, I learned a lot about writing essays. I've written zero essays since I graduated. In my free time, I edited videos, and I've edited hundreds of videos and gotten paid for it. So the lesson is, if you're interested in working in a certain field or industry, can you come up with a hobby that's going to help you develop skills that you can apply in that field? Can you figure out what skills people in your industry are looking for and start to develop those skills? I don't say this to dismiss college at all. I loved every minute of it and I learned so much from all the classes I took, but college is also about exploring your other interests and developing skills in addition to those you're picking up in the classroom. And that wasn't really clear to me when I was going into it, but it's very clear now looking back. When I graduated from college, I was offered a full-time job by Casey Neistat, who I'd interned for every summer. The job was to be an assistant and office manager and basically help him make YouTube videos. 
now by the older people in my life, my parents and school teachers, this was a strange job to take. It was seen as a sort of dead end. Of course, they didn't realize how fast YouTube was growing and how important a piece of the media landscape it would become. I was told to look for a job in Hollywood if I wanted to get into film, but I saw things differently. And I think I had more rel relevant experience. I recognized that in 2013, people were watching more and more videos online. And it was somebody's job to make those videos. When I graduated college, mobile internet speeds weren't quite fast enough for people to watch videos on their phones regularly, but it was obvious that this was coming. More and more of our time would be spent watching videos on our phones and YouTube creators like Casey were an obvious source for these videos. And I was 22 years old. Why not try and take a chance doing a job I knew that I would like, that my gut was telling me to take? The company was super small, it was just me and my boss, so there would be lots of opportunities to learn all sorts of new skills. In the first year, I shot and produced countless videos. I took a class at night on bookkeeping so I could manage the company's finances and keep track of budgets. I got to meet countless interesting people who came through the office for different projects. Most importantly though, I was pushed out of my comfort zone and forced to constantly learn new skills. The most important lesson I learned in this early gig is that there was nothing I couldn't do. Everything I could ever want to learn is Googleable from fixing a camera, to learning how to drive stick shift, to rewiring a light switch, to installing a sink. There was nothing I couldn't learn how to do with the power of the internet. And I had a boss who would rather see me try to figure it out, try to figure out how to do something and fail, than say I didn't know how to do it. And that's a lesson that I've carried with me in all aspects of my life to this point. The more times you try to figure out something you don't know how to do, the more confident you become in yourself. A year or so into this job, I faced a major shift. Casey was given an opportunity to start a social media company and I was offered a job as the first employee. This would mean putting aside my filmmaking career and focusing on something dramatically different. But on the other hand, it was an opportunity to try and build something entirely new from the ground up. Again, I would get to learn a whole new set of skills and do so in an industry that was clearly growing. Tech companies like Snapchat, Twitter, Instagram, Vine were all taking off. So I hit pause on my filmmaking aspirations and went full steam into the tech world. We started a company called Beam in 2014 and I got to do everything from running business administration to heading community to managing user feedback to working in product development. I spent countless hours in the office, often getting in at 6.30 in the morning and leaving at 10 or 11 at night. There was always an endless list of things to do and never enough hours in the day. But you can learn a lot under this type of pressure. In 2017, Beam was sold to CNN for $27 million. I was paid out for the equity I had in the company and offered a job under the CNN umbrella. We were shifting back into the business of making videos. After three years working in a tech startup, I had a new opportunity to be a video creator and I started working on YouTube videos again under the Beam News moniker. Unfortunately, the relationship between Beam and CNN never really clicked and a year later, the partnership was shut down and I was laid off. I was 27 years old and up to this point, everything I'd done in my career was a progression from one thing to the next. This was the first time that the next step wasn't so obvious. And this is why it was such an important inflection point. I had to look back at everything I'd done up to that point and add it all up. What did I like doing? What did I wanna be? How did I wanna spend my days? I decided to make a YouTube video to summarize my work experiences up to that point. It went viral and I realized that maybe this was something I could do independently, or at least I could try. I had long realized the power of storytelling online. I had some money saved up from the sale of the company a year earlier, and I would get two and a half months of severance pay from CNN. I had flexibility to take my time figuring out my next move, and I knew I had developed a wide set of valuable skills. It was in this transition period that I started to put the puzzle together and figure out how to turn those skills into my own small business. So now we're back at the beginning of the story. And I've spent the last three years figuring out my current job one day at a time. I still make YouTube videos on a consistent basis. Sometimes I get paid by sponsors to make these videos, but more often I try to do it for fun. In addition to these sponsored YouTube videos, I operate a production company with my brother. We specialize in helping businesses tell their stories through video. Having a YouTube channel where I can share creative projects helps bring more clients into the business. It's a sort of proof that we know what we're doing. Every single day, more and more videos made by pros are uploaded to the internet. There's a never ending stream of businesses that need people like me to make these videos. 
The irony is that in the past year, movie theaters have shut down, but the internet, of course, has not. I think about what if I'd pursued that more traditional path that so many of my teachers suggested, and I worked in Hollywood. Would I be able to work on something now? I can sit in my office and make a video all by myself whenever I want to. And as soon as it's done, I can put it on the internet and who knows might watch it and what kind of opportunity that might turn into. At the end of the day, I'm also just happy to be making videos. That was my goal from the beginning. And I still firmly believe that I'm getting better with each one. I'm getting better at shooting and editing and writing and still learning new tricks and techniques. You don't know what twists and turns your career is going to take. But as long as you're trying to learn as much as possible along the way, I think it'll turn out okay. Take stock of the things that you're interested in. How can you do more of these things in a way that's productive? They say that if you love your job, you'll never work a day in your life. And I know that's cliche, but it's true. If you follow what's in your heart and really dedicate yourself to it, you'll build your dream job. Thank you. We want to thank everybody who stayed tuned with us and watched today. And we also want to give a special thanks to all of our speakers and their great speeches. And now with closing remarks, please welcome Provost Kirsch. On this day at universities and communities all across the United States and the world, folks have gotten together to celebrate ideas, innovations, individuals and institutions through the TEDx platform, just as we are here at Wake Forest in Rome, Italy, in Cairo, Egypt, in Islamabad, Pakistan, in Xi'an, China, in St. Andrews in the UK, and in Pune, India, universities, just like Wake Forest, are holding celebrations of TEDx. So what's special about the Wake Forest TEDx of 2021? Two things. First of all, we're one of the only universities and only communities where students, Wake Forest undergraduates, do all the organizing, inviting, strategizing, and celebrating of the TEDx event. A couple of our offices provide a little funding, but otherwise this is entirely student organized and run. That's not the case at our fellow universities around the United States and the world. It's also the case, second, that the TEDx at Wake Forest University as organized by students is now in its 12th consecutive year. We didn't stop for a pandemic in 2020 and we haven't stopped in 2021. There's a lot of schools that have been doing a few TEDx over the years, but Wake Forest stands along with one other institution in the United States as uninterrupted, chosen by TEDx to host this remarkable celebration of individuals, of ideas, of innovations, and of institutions. So today in Gainesville, Florida, at the University of Florida, today in small private schools like Claremont Graduate School in California, today at Vanderbilt University, organized for the last time by Provost Susan Wente in her office before she becomes president, Susan Wente of Wake Forest, there are TEDx celebrations happening, much like ours, but ours, organized by students, and ours at Wake Forest, have run uninterrupted for more than a decade, distinctively in the United States and all the world. Congratulations to those who organized this. I'm so looking forward to the extraordinary day that lies ahead. Go Deeks.